Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to the 10th module in the DTB KBA Financial Literacy and Enterprise Development Training Program. It has been quite the journey, very insightful, very enriching, and, and thank you so much for being part of this journey so far. Once more, welcome to the 10th module, which is on credit readiness. We saved truly the best for last, and we are excited for today's session. And as usual, we would be we are excited to find out where you're joining us from, um, what you know, the names of your businesses, the industries you are in, and, and what you are taking away so far from, from the financial literacy and enterprise development um, training program for 2023. It has been 10 weeks of great insights. We've had enriching modules. We've had entrepreneurship, customer excellence, total quality management. I mean, it has been a great, a great session. So today we have um, enter we have credit readiness and we're excited to, to really finish strong. And so thank you. Thank you so much for joining. We have Billy from Bugoma, Joyce from Nairobi. I mean, the names now are are familiar. This is fantastic. I mean, it is a bittersweet day. So we have Eric from Nairobi. He's telling us another great day indeed. We have Said Chambea from County 002. Lilis Cupcakes from Kitengela. Karibuni sana, sana, sana. You can let us know what has stood out for you so far. What module really spoke to you and, and what changes have you, you know, brought into your business? We have Nashon from Nar. Ray from Eldoret. We have Raphael from Fresh Produce Consortium. Karibu Nisana. We have Kilifi. I, you know, the, the, the amount of people who join us from different parts of the country, sometimes even beyond Kenya. It's quite, quite amazing. So thank you so much for continuously walking this journey with us. It has been amazing. Even from our end as DTB, we've gotten to, to gain insights. We've gotten to interact with our customers um, and even new, new people and new businesses that we haven't interacted with before. So, so we, are, we are really grateful. Um, you can, also, as always, confirm if you can hear us well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have... Um, Abigail, who is our sign language interpreter. So once you select the interpretation tab at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to select American Sign Language and, and she will show on the side of your screen. We will also communicate the same on, on the chat tab. So as always, for any um, questions you may have, please address them to the Q&A tab. And then for any comments, feedback, observations, you can address them to the chat tab also at the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. So today's session is being facilitated by um, the CEO of Edge360, who is Colin Smbulika, and he's also join, joined by his colleague, Marion Chahenza. So today is a double, you know, double takeaway. It's, it's an amazing way to, to end and the trainings, the official training sessions. So we have Collins, who, who is the CEO of Edge360. He is an experienced professional with 19 years in the financial sector. He has worked even in the banking industry. He's been the head of SME at Guarantee Trust Bank Kenya, um, head of SME at Chase Bank, um, and has also managed branches at Bank of Africa and Housing Finance. He has an MBA in banking and finance from Mo University. Become in business administration and a CPA one and a member of Kenya Institute of Bankers. So he's richly uh, experienced in the banking industries. And so even when he takes us through credit readiness today, it will from a, be a, from a place of experience, both from the banking side and, and you know outside of banking. So we have an amazing session coming our way. And then we also have Marion Chahenza, who's the admin administration and process manager for Edge360. She's excellent at training micro businesses and how to scale and to break down seemingly difficult financial terminology. So today we're going to really learn this finance jargon and really understand how to package our businesses to be credit ready, right? So she has 15 years, over 15 years of experience of banking and operations management experience, um, having worked at Shusho Capital and Equity Bank. So Marion at 
Equity Bank was a champion of their women product, women product, Fanikisha Loans, and her role was to train the micro women in business on best practices to run successful businesses. She has an executive MBA from Strathmore Business School and a bachelor's degree in tourism management from Moy University. So today we really have expertise in the room so that you can be equipped to package your businesses so that you're able to access credit. We are very excited and we hope you are too. And so I would, without much further ado, would like to welcome Collins to begin the session. Karibu sana Collins. Thank you, Mantui. Uh, I'll just put the video so that people can see the face and know a, a name. It's not the lady picture you're seeing there. It's me. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'd just like to say, um, you know, the project, the program that we are training today, uh, being the 10th module, it's going to be a little faster for yourselves. Uh, I saw on module seven, if we have people who have joined us right from the beginning, uh, there's a module seven, which was on financial management. So we'll just touch a little bit about that because you cannot really remove credit and financial management. They always go hand in hand, but I'll try and brush it through. Um, but really what we are training is as a result of a curriculum that H360 developed uh, on the help by, you know, through funding by the UK Kenya Tech Hub, that's UK Aid, because there was... Um, the program that they put up was a debt access program, you know, trying to find out um, women, for business women, they, they are saying they're not accessing money, yet we have banks that are saying we have money set aside for business women, especially, specifically. But we do know that these findings cut across, whether you're a business woman or a businessman, it's still the same. But the program was really uh, hinged on finding out what is that gap? Because we went to the field, we did an empirical study, we talked to bank CEOs, and found out, yes, you have the money, then how comes you're not lending as much uh, to the SMEs, uh, especially led by women kind of SMEs? And they told us the reasons. We went into the field, we went into the micro businesses and the normal SMEs and found out from them. And we asked them, OK, why are you not accessing the fund? And so from there, we were able to see the gap. Uh, and from that gap, we developed a curriculum. And that curriculum is what we'll be sharing today as part of this training program that we're doing today. And we just want to thank uh, DTB, uh, you know, and KBA for, you know, selecting us and putting us in the program uh, because we do believe that it is a wealth of experience, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity to get this experience and of knowledge uh, into the SMEs out there. And we do believe that the SMEs will be greatly, greatly helped. And so without much further ado, uh, I'll start. Um, Mantui, thank you for the introduction. It was really good. Uh, I'm not going to add anything to it. I'll just go straight to the point. And so I'll just start. So I won't talk so much about our company. H360, I, I as you heard, was in head uh, in banking, left banking in 2016, and then now moved into entrepreneurship. We started with lending, micro lendings first, and then now diversified into consulting. And so what we do is mostly to do with lending and, 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 and research, just project implementations that's what we do, helping businesses grow. And the team, you can see them. Today you'll be in contact with Marion and myself. Irene, also our colleague, won't be here with us today. So I'll just get straight to it. What is credit? We all know credit. It's a contractual agreement between two people. You have a lender who is in business and a business person who wants to grow. And... Obviously, the lender is not just lending money out of it, out of goodwill, uh, insofar as there is a profit for them. It's they're in business. And so the sooner we realize that as SMEs, the better, because we need to understand that um, whoever has lent us money, we need to pay it back and pay at an interest. And the good thing uh, with the laws in Kenya, especially, uh, protects any borrower needs to know in advance all the charges up front. They call it, the banks call it the TCC, like terms and conditions up front. So no surprises, no shocks. Now, a lot of institutions do lend money and we're just touching on a few of them. This is not all of them, but just a few of them. We have banks, we have microfinance banks, we have circles, we have insurance companies, fintechs, charmers. And we also know we normally sometimes go to family and friends. And then we have the Shylocks, which is the unregulated informal sectors. And as family and friends is also informal. Um, but today we are happy to have a DTB here. And as we know, uh, this course that you're doing, there'll be a certification that will follow. 
and Mantui and the rest at DTB, I'm sure once you're done with this course, we'll always look at you favorably so far as their loan applications are concerned. But what I would just like to say, of all the lenders that you're seeing up there, banks are always the best priced in so far as the interest rate charge, you know, and, and formality. So it's always good to have a good bank as a relationship in so far as loans are concerned. We're happy DTB is here today with us. So, you know, uh, the questions we always ask ourselves is loans are loans good or bad, you know? But for me, what I'll say is that loans are definitely good if used in the right uh, perspective or purpose. You know, the banks will always try to find out why are you borrowing, what are you gonna put it into, and all that. But you know, obviously, ultimately, once the money comes through, the banks will try and do all the checks and balances. But ultimately, the money will come into your control. And the how you use it is what will, will will determine whether that loan was good or bad. Because say, for example, you're given money to purchase stock and it's in the credit paper and the bank has released money yet. By the time the money hits, a new idea comes in and say, okay, well, how about I buy a building? Or how about I buy a plot? Then already you're diversifying the purpose and you're messing up with the purpose of that particular loan. And by that, it kind of already starts making the loan look bad. Because we always say if a loan is used for consumption, then that's not a good loan. But if it's used for production, then highly likely it is going to be a good loan. Because what you're doing is that you're using today's money to generate income and to pay in tomorrow's money. And we all know tomorrow's money always has a kind of weaker value compared to today's money. So if you take a loan and put it into good purpose, then definitely answer is it's a good, a good investment. There are very many types of loans. Uh, many institutions or lenders, banks call them differently. But what we have here is we're just calling broadly, like long-term loans. Any loan that is more than a year is considered a long-term loan. Any loan that is shorter than one year is a short-term loan. Overdrafts, we all know what overdrafts are, but I'll just mention it. It's when the bank assesses your performance, your bank statement performance, and then give you an you know, like authority in their system to overdraw your account to a particular limit. It's a good one because it helps you, especially businesses, when you sell on credit, then you're able to access this money uh, by going, you know, overdraft, you know, like going over your, your limit in the account. Um, we see instances where people miss, you abuse this because what happens is that you might do an overdraft in this particular bank and then you keep you don't bank because the strength of an overdraft is activity. So we encourage businesses when banks are giving you an overdraft limit, keep activity in that account. We, there's a word called swinging. Keep that overdraft swinging, you know, like go back into positive, then take it back into the negative, positive, negative. Because you remember overdrafts are always renewed. They are, it's a renewable product. Every year, the, the banks always look and see how did this gentleman or lady in this business perform with this overdraft where they see instances of a stack nature stack means you went overdraft and then you never came back to swing to credit or you know you could still stay at the you know at the debit position where you're borrowing but then there's activity that's still good for them because they look banks look at what activity are you moving there so we encourage people to keep uh, uh, the overdraft active I avoid instances where you have an OD in one bank and then now you go operate in another account. Then that way, what happens is that you're you're limiting your ability to get a limit enhancement because banks will always enhance your limit. If they see that you need more money in, in so far as your credit, because remember, if you're a business that sells on credit and you're growing, then that means your credit that you're giving out there is also growing. So it just matches that the bank should also increase your overdraft limit in that X aspect. But, but that's just one way that we try to encourage your businesses to to grow and then is stock loans it's just specific the purpose is specific to stock so the banks match your cycle trading cycle to that stock so they see how long do you keep your stocks to give you a particular stock loan it's always short term in nature accounts receivable loans means you are expecting some money and then they're giving you money the, the most famous one there is normally the invoice discounting product so it's easy because once you've delivered a service and you've invoiced, then you're expecting some money. So banks would use the invoices to work at a product. Uh, sometimes it's a collateral. They would talk, depends with a, with a lender. Uh, importer finance facilities is also very specific to importation. So you want to bring a, a product 
you know, from overseas, then they will look at it and say, okay, fine, how do we structure it? Depending on the agreement that you have with the people who are selling you the commodity. You know, it could be letters of credit, it could be, you know, direct purchase credit. It depends. So the banks will always work a facility for you. Mortgage, we all know it's about purchasing a property. So sometimes businesses want to purchase offices. So there's also products for that. Uh, so it's related to a building. LPO financing really is, is more like you have a contract, you have a purchase order, you don't have the funding there. So the banks would want to look at that to see how they can structure facility for you. Most of the times there'll be security involved because there's a risk of performance that has not yet uh, been done. Um, contract financing on the other end, uh, it's just almost like LPO because you have a contract and you need some funding. Uh, debt factoring is almost like invoice discounting because you you have someone who has uh, it's it's like your what 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 can I use there uh, in in except uh, um, so so I don't repeat my word factoring. It's like you're selling a debt, you know, like you're selling or transferring ownership of something that you're expecting to be paid. Um, we also have asset finance. With asset finance, it's pegged to an asset it could be a machine it could be a, a motor vehicle the good thing about this is not it's normally self-financing so it's easy to get this as a business but a business just needs to understand when i go to the bank to get such a, a facility then i'm looking at my productivity then it means if i have this asset then i'll be able to generate extra income maybe you're leasing or you're hiring right now but if it comes into your book then it will save you money on expenses and leasing, but then increase your productivity. So there's all that calculation that a business has to do to ensure that uh, you get the proper asset financing structure for you. But it's always very easy because, like I mentioned, it's self-securing. Then agricultural loans, depending on product you're doing based on agriculture, and there are many others. I encourage you to, you know, talk to the DTB guys, walk into the branches and find out the products. On the documents required, uh, we all mostly or most of us know about these documents. I'll just do a quick run through. Obviously, we need your national ID bank, ID, ID copy, carry pin, business registration certificate. And let me park here at business registration certificate. So most Some businesses are operating in by themselves as a name. I am a trader by my own name and my I'm trading as myself. Now, we always encourage people to register because registering your business helps with the, if you're kind of formalizing your business. Um, Institutions that are lending always like to deal with a, a formal institution. So, and and with the e-citizen these days, it's made it much, much easier. You can just log into e your e-citizen e and apply under the Business Names Act for a sole proprietor. I think the fee right now is about 1,000, 1,500, and you get your business registered, and then you go back to the bank. They open for you a, particular, a specific account for that particular business. So they will open your name, um, trading as, your name, personal name, trading as the particular name that uh, you have taken uh, or you've chosen and the, that certificate shows. And the other options normally, obviously, is the limited liability option, uh, which is uh, under the Companies Act. Uh, again, eCitizen is helping us with this registration, but you can still also go to your lawyer and get a, a company incorporated. It's always good and important when you're dealing with a formal institution because then you you know you looked at more favorably. There's a passport photo. Most banks take at, at the at the at the account opening time. The bank statements, and I'll pack at the bank statements a bit. Um, it is encouraged that you actively use your bank statements because, like I mentioned when I was talking about the overdrafts, most banks, most lenders look at the activity. It's the activity that speaks. You know, you can come and say and speak and give us a pitch about your business. But at the end of the day, what they will do, they will, the banks always look at the, your, your activity through your bank statement. So, and I always encourage people, you know, you, you could be a trading, say, for example, a, a business, um, say it's a business that sells 10,000 shillings a day and it needs stock worth 7,000 that very morning. Say, you know, let's just talk about a hotel, a small hotel somewhere. Uh, so you need to buy fresh produce, meat, everything, 7,000 every day. Your profit at the end of the day is 3,000, for example. Uh, then you find a business that decides to be banking religiously, the profit, 3,000 every day. At the end of the month, um, because you've been banking 3,000 every, every, every day, then at the end of the day, you find that it's 3,000 times three. So it's showing that you're a 
90,000 kind of a business. But yet, on the 30 days, if you were banking, the entire amount of revenues you are selling, which is 10,000, then you really you're a 300,000 uh, kind of a business. You know, that kind of an, a, a perspective. You know, so so when the bank's looking at the statement, they're looking at your activity. So when it comes to an overdraft, say, for example, you're selling on credit, the same example selling on credit, then memory serves me right. You know, like when it comes to overdrafts, the maximum overdraft you can get is 100% of your banking. That's the maximum. In other words, you'll be able to swing it back, you know, to, to, the, to at least position zero. So you'll find that a customer like this can qualify for a 300,000 loan. Whereas the other one would qualify for the 90,000 loan overdraft. So it's good. We encourage you to keep banking because when the more you bank, the more attractive you look. I remember this project was all about making you attractive to the bank. So anyway, let's move on. A applicable licenses. You look at all the licenses that you are required to have. County licenses, we encourage you to pay for them. Don't uh, take a, a stance that my business is so far away. Uh, from you know where the county people will come so you don't get it because when when it comes to time for applying for a loan banks are checking out to see how compliant are you because remember the county business can come and shut your business that very day when they come and find that your licenses are not up to speed or they could fine you and that would mean it would jeopardize the money that the bank has lent you so it is always encouraged and advisable for you to keep on uh, sending on more documents financial statements i know you did in your module seven financial manage uh you know the financial module but let's just quickly run through this is financial statement that's like a management account or an audited account uh audited accounts are simply when you call an auditor to come and look at your books management accounts are what you generate yourself with your product and i'm happy to just mention that dtb in its themselves are coming up with a new product called infinity and i'm aware and told that it is actually live for the you know, for trials, and I'd encourage all of you here who are in this class to join in and become, you know, opt opt in to be used in as 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 people of the first group that uh, that is being used because it it will help you when you're selling and you're recording every sales that you're putting on that Infinity app. What it's doing at the background is that it's generating a profit and loss statement for you. It's generating a balance sheet, it's re generating a report for whoever owes you money then you know you're able to see in that report so and and i haven't been told about any fear about it but hey i would say join in join in on that infinity product um and and see how it helps you because one of the things that um and i know being ahead of sme at one point at the banks one of the things that used to make a lot of smes miss out uh on on, on lending on on good products on good you know like facilities was record keeping so by the time you're able to join in on Infinity and have a product like that, then remember the person who's, you know, with that product, which is now the bank, would easily look at uh, you favorably at getting funding uh, because they, they can see your records are well kept. You don't even need to print out anything or if you need to print and give them, then you can print and give them. But that already gives you an advantage. I'll encourage you towards the end, we'll share you with you a, a link that you can join in on that Infinity. So there's another product, uh, uh, a financial document called the projected cash flow. Now, we'll have uh, some time just to look at one in more details because every bank that lends money out there, if it always looks at the projected cash flow. Most of the times what happens is that if you don't, if you say as an SME give uh, the bank a facility request and you don't put in your projected cash flow, you'll find someone calling you from credit and asking you some questions. So what they are doing at the background is that they are really generating a projected cash flow for you. They're looking, what's the purpose of this loan? How will that loan help your business? And what's the impact of that loan on your business? Is it a positive impact? Is it a negative impact? So I encourage you to check out um, projected cash flows. You know, these, these days, um, a lot of our informations are found on online, even if you just go there and just take projected cash flows. Because remember, nobody would know your business better than yourself. You would understand it. And you, by the time you're coming to borrow the facility, you even know the purpose of that facility much, much more than the banker. Um, then there's the edge data and creditors list. This is just a list that shows you or shows, you know, who owes you and for how long have they been owing you or who do you owe and for how long you've been owing. Like I mentioned again, Infinity will help you, uh, you know, capture your people who owe you money, debtors in the list. Because if you're selling on credit, then the Infinity app by DTB can be able to help you. 
the memorandum and article of, of association, these are just rules and regulations of your company. The annual returns, uh, this, this one talks about the, if you're a limited liability company, you have to file annual returns. This is at the, filed at the Sharia house annually. Uh, so that just to show the, the business is still alive as per the records at the Sharia house. Uh, and then there's a copy of collateral depending on the facility and the product, depending on how you uh, negotiated with the bank. Then they'll be able to you'll be able to give them a copy of the collateral. It could be a copy of title, whatever it is that uh, you're talking about. And then a business and company profile. Remember, you know your business better than the the banker. So what you need to do is have a good profile that talks about your business, everything that you're doing in the business, what you're planning to do. You know your your purposes, the problems that you're solving as a business. Package it so nicely because remember, even the analyst or the the, the relationship manager who's working at your application will need to put up a formal document that goes into the credit department. So you're generally just making it uh, better and, and, and more, you know, accessible. So I, I don't want to bore you too much with the financials, but it's important. If you're running a business, there are things that you must understand. Uh, there's something called a balance sheet. Now you have the asset side of a balance sheet and then you have the liability side. The assets are anything that a business has that generates income. With the liabilities is anything that takes away your income, or in other words, is an expense. And all of those are put together into something that balances and it's called a balance sheet. Now, the loans that you take, for example, let's say, for example, I take a loan of 100,000, then it is already a liability. But if I use that loan to purchase stock, then that stock quickly, immediately goes into my asset side. And remember, that stock, I'm going to sell it at a much, much higher price than what I'm going to pay for my loan. That's that's now business because as you're selling these assets, you're increasing your cash position. So you've taken 100,000 in liability, booked it as a loan, moved it up onto the asset side as stock worth 100,000. And I'm selling, say, for example, my margin is what, even if it's 30%, let's just talk about gross margin, is at 30%. So I'm supposed to generate at least 130,000 shillings. If I'm selling this stock within a week, then I need to have added additional cash of 30,000 within that week. And so, and that's what we're talking about. If it's an overdraft, then I've borrowed 100,000, put a stock, generated 30,000 the first week, the second week, again, because the overdraft is still there, I've covered my overdraft, I've gone above by 30,000. I've taken again 100,000, purchased more stock. So by the end of the month, I've done 30,000 times four. You know, in that case, it's 120,000. So my balance sheet is growing because your cash asset side, this side is growing. And in the liability side, it will be, that, that's a profit. That's a profit generating. You're, you're increasing your net worth. So that's business. So that's like, it comes back to what we're talking about. When we take a, a loan, use it for the right purposes, then it grows the business. So we need to understand that we need to keep growing our assets. Um, and this is just what it looks like. I know all of you running businesses have seen this before, and so I will not spend so much time. So you know what your assets are, like your cash in hand, cash at banks are just example, your stock, uh, debtors if you have, and then there's prepaid, if you've pre prepaid anything, that's a, that's an, an asset. Uh, furniture could be long term, you know, like in this particular case, you're looking at examples, a motorcycle. So it's a balance sheet size of 7.5. Let's see how he's funded it. On the other side, he has creditors. People he has sold on credit. That's 500,000. Um, he has bought from on credit. Uh, so he needs to pay 500,000 and paid bills 100,000. Uh, loans from the bank, 1.5. And so he had put in a capital of 2 million in this particular business. And then we can see that it's a business that has been generating income. So he has some retained income of 3.4 million. So generally our idea as a business is to keep growing and focusing on our assets, but use the liabilities wisely because there are people who are ready to give us funding, use it wisely to grow our business. And that's why DTB is here because they have the fundings to, uh, uh, you know, to lend. So they lend you the funding, use it very wisely in your business grow the assets, grow this, uh, your inventories, and then you keep growing with them. And that's how come you see that someone might start with a very small loan of 50,000 shillings, for example, but within two, three years, they are accessing as up, even up to 7 million, 10 million, because they've been growing. Um, and one of the things you'll see towards, when I keep on uh, going on, I'll tell you some of the, from our study that we did, what are the best practices that you need to practice, to, to do uh, towards making you more attractive towards accessing funding. 
Uh, we do have the income and expense tracker. We always say it's important to know on a day-to-day -day basis how you're doing. Tracking your profits. Are you profitable? Are you loss making? It's good to know because if you know it early, you know, um, earlier on, people would wait for a whole year for the auditor to come and do a P and L. Then now determine, oh, okay, I'm profitable or I'm not. I'm loss making. These days, it's, it's been an information age. An infinity app comes, and if you can't take the infinity app by DTB, then they're able to help you because as you sell, you know, it is showing you how much you've purchased and your income and the profits that you're making. So it's tabulating for you an, an income statement. And let me tell you the importance of getting to know uh, your profit positions on a day-to-day -day basis. The earlier you realize that you're not making as much profit that you need, that you are planning, or you're getting into the lost territory, the faster it is for you to make adjustments. So the adjustments you can make is, hey, let me look for another supplier of these commodities who will sell me at a lower price, or increase the prices depending on the market environments. Uh, because we are saying you must be in profit. You cannot be working so hard every day, waking up early in the morning and then still uh, making either very low margins or at losses. So it is important to digitize yourself. So one of the things we were learning in this research was that digitization is very, very important, especially in this day and age. And I'm happy again, just to mention the TB has that digitization app called Infinity. And so this is just uh, an example of a p and L. I mean, you're all running businesses, you all know them, you know, you have your sales, you have your cost of goods, then you have your gross profit, then you have your operating profits, uh, expenses, which is now your rent, you know, your salaries, your airtime. So these are things you need to keep on looking at and saying, asking yourself questions, which ones should I stop or reduce? Or because you're trying to increase the bottom line. At the end of the year, what you're looking at is a net profit. You could have someone who's moving twice your revenues. You know, like in this particular case, we can have someone who has done sales of two times this, maybe be 250,000. Uh, but their profit is the same 40,000. You are generating 125,000 worth of uh, sales, but your profit 40,000. So the idea is, it's not about how much you can move. It's about how much profit remains. And so the question is, how do I maximize or how what do I need to do to make sure that I'm generating as much profit as possible as a good businessman. Uh, so I'd mentioned about the projected cash flow, and here it is. A projected cash flow just simply talks about your gap. How much money do I need? And the purposes or the functions that I will use that money for. So by the time you're approaching a bank and you have this projected cash flow. It's very clear. It shows the, the bank that, hey, listen, I'm very aware of what I'm doing. I have this particular amount of cash. Like, let's say, use this one as an example. First of all, we have to understand banks don't necessarily lend to new businesses, but this is just an example. So this is a business that had 250,000 and needed a loan of 550,000 shillings. Now, with that 550,000, this is how they are planning to use it. They are planning to purchase, to pay rent, uh, which is 40,000 in this particular instance. And then there were some payroll taxes to be paid, payroll and payroll taxes, salaries and salaries and, you know, NHIF. Uh, then there was stock that needed to be purchased in this particular case, 120,000. And then there was an asset to be purchased, which was to help the business. So the total spend was 386 at just at the start. So by the time they're starting, the cash that was available is 414,000. You can see there for the next, now the first operating month. Now, when they started, they, obviously their sales were very low, as you can see, they only did 3,230. But as the months go on, you can see it keeps on improving to 9,450. So there's a general increase. And what we are trying to say, and what you're trying to show the bank is that, hey, listen, if I did not have this money, if I did not have this stock, if I did not have this asset, then I would not be able to generate this income. So it is important because then you're looking at the generation of the income. And you can see as you go down, you're capturing your expenses, the fixed cost, that's rent. Uh, you're looking at the salaries. And that's why we always tell businesses, the things that you need to check out when you begin is your fixed cost. Because fixed cost means even if I don't sell, I will pay for them. Like now the rent. So he, this particular person won, went on a unit of 40000 or a premises of 40,000. Now, what that it means is that you see in this particular case, when he started and paid, uh, only sold 3,230 worth, 
he still paid a rent of 50,000. You already still had uh, salaries to pay, which is also kind of fixed because whether you sell or not, unless those salaries are put in a state where they are variable, then that kind of changes because you're telling your salespeople, if you sell so much, then I'll pay you so much. Otherwise, this is your minimum sell. So when you are able to prepare this as a business person, even before you've at, at, uh, approached uh, the bank, then it kind of gives you a very clear picture and then tells you, is this loan enough or do I need to add more loans? If I had space, I'd show you the entire uh, projections all the way to the end. This particular business was able to keep on increasing its sales to a level where obviously it became profitable. And you see with the bank, they want to know, are you going to be making your monthly payments as well? So capture that very clearly on the projection that you can see here, there's repay loan and it's, it's there and it's very well and any other bills. So projections really is us as business people trying to look and project as far as possible uh, and to kind of justify the kind of facility that we are trying to get uh, to be put into the business. Now, when you have this and you're presenting it together with your well done company profile and your business is registered, uh, then are we able to discuss and sit down with the bankers and then say, hey, listen, this is what we want to do. So they look at it, they come to your site, the way they're trained, they will be able to give you very good advice whether it's sufficient or not. And then either collateral or which type of product fits. Remember, we talked about a lot of products, so it, they will be able to look at that and see which one fits. So with that, the Q&As, we'll have a session for Q&As towards the end. But what I'll just want to do now is I'll just like to go into what we were able to establish as best practice. Remember, uh, for those who have joined us as we've been going on, uh, we did a study uh, on behalf of the UK Kenya Tech Hub, which is the UK aid, uh, that's the UK government. Um, you know, they, they, they wanted to find out an impact, you know, just a social impact project where you're looking at the market and saying, we have banks that are saying they have money to lend into businesses. And especially in uh, this particular project we're doing, we're looking at the project, uh, at business, are uh, businesses run by women and uh, women owned or women managed uh, pro uh, businesses. So we're looking at them and, 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 and so we went into the market, look, talk to the banks. We were talking to some bank CEOs. We just did a, 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 a general survey and found out, okay, let's start with the banks that have, you know, women led products uh, for that particular project. And then talk to the bank CEOs and found out, okay, why, what is the challenge? You know, the, the business women out there are saying they're not able to access funding because we indeed did go to the ground and, and went went all the way micro and also did your normal SMEs. We did the micro businesses in the Kiambu County and then did normal SMEs uh, businesses in Nairobi County. And so the, the feedback that we were getting, uh, both from the banks and from the you know beneficiaries of, of the, the, the credits uh, or the fund, um, was that there was a gap. And so with that gap, we're able to develop a curriculum. And with that curriculum, uh, we trained the business women and we are happy even now that DTB has called on us. And, and this is the kind of training that we have been training. So what we'll, I'll be going through is really the best practices that came out or emanated from that study. This would show you as a business what you need to be doing to enable you access credit from the banks. And so <clears throat> the first one is regular banking. So. So what the banks were saying is, hey, see, we have applications that come in, but when we are matching it with our bank statements or activities is that we find there's no you know, activity. And true, when you go to the ground, you find that most businesses are retaining cash uh, you know, and trading and not banking the cash. Now, what that just does is that it kind of gives up an Im image of what you really are not. And remember the example that I used about the business that turns over 10,000 shillings every day, but banks only 3,000. So it kind of shows that it's an, you know, a 90,000 business. Yet this is really a 300,000 revenue per month kind of a business because you're generating. Remember you're generating. It's about activity. Uh, so what we, we came to realize is that and encourage, you know, even now that we're going into a lot of digitization, regular banking helps you access more funding. Now with DTB Bank, Diamond Trust Bank in this particular instance, you'll see they have this app they're calling Infinity. So I know if you lo log into the uh, Infinity app and, and you start using it, they have an SDK push uh, on M-Pesa, you know, as you, as, they, as you make the sales comes into the bank account, um, 
the Pesa link as well. You can also use Pesa link uh, to swipe in and to money is into the account. Generally, things that are helping with your regular banking. Um, we also have like when you have Mpesas, uh, like a, a pay bill uh, or or a buy goods. You know, it could terminate into your bank account. Uh, that way, at least you have that activity coming in. Some banks these days are also saying, show us your bank, your Mpesa statements uh, as we make the analysis. So generally, regular banking helps you look more attractive. That was our finding. Uh, the next thing was record keeping. Now, we record keeping is is so critical because um, an SME, you know, SMEs we are very good because right now I consider myself also as an SME uh, because I'm now in consulting. We are very good at what we do. You know, we know what we need to do and we do it and we do it very well. Now, our challenge comes in when we have to start keeping records uh, because that means you have to stop what you're doing and follow through with record keeping. So what businesses do is that they hire. You hire an accountant or you hire someone to keep your records for you. But we do know, remember the projected cash flow that we looked at. Those are fixed expenses and sometimes very expensive. And so we, what we are encouraging businesses to do now is digitize their business. You know, when you digitize your business, it kind of takes care of your record keeping because what you're doing, whatever the business it is you're doing, it's a sale, right? So you raise an invoice and you've made a sale. It's recorded. Uh, you, you've you purchased some stock, so it's an expense. You record it in that digital app, or whichever it is. Like now in this case with DTB, they have Infinity app. And I would encourage all of us here to join and sign up on that Infinity app because it, this is, it, it will take care of your hassle for record keeping. Uh, because at the end of the month, you, as a business, you not have to stop and say, okay, fine, I've been trading. Now let me look at my records you know, and keep up my records. No, no, no. You've been keeping your records if you're selling or you've digitized your business through this app, app, uh, app uh, or software. Um, and so that helps. So generally, one of the other things that helps is record keeping. Keep your records well, because one of the first things when you approach bankers, the first thing they ask you is, let me see your management account. Uh, then you start, okay, let me go and have an accountant to prepare them. Already there, you're not looking so good because that means you're not tracking your business, right? But if you have an app, a nice app that you've taken up, then all you just need to do is print the report. And like I said, this record keeping is good. It's, 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 even, it's really important for us as business owners, more than even for the banks, because as the business owners, we want to know, are we making money or are we not making cash? The third thing we saw, well, there are seven, there are not very many, the third thing we saw is that good repayment history. These days we know about uh, CRB. So your credit record is always is up, is always there and, and good to, and is open to the public. I mean, whoever wants to check can always find it. So we encourage good repayment history. I always like to look at it this way. Uh, if you have a bank lending you money or any institution lends you, lending you cash, what it just means is that these people have been in enough on your business to believe in your business and to give you some funding. Now, by virtue of them doing that, uh, it is in your interest as a business person to maintain that relationship and keep a relationship going well. Because remember, you are a growing business. Unless you're planning to shut down a business, you will always be in growth mode. So in other words, you're trying to buy more stock to sell more stock or hire more people so that you can give more services. So anything more requires funding because that means you just have to sell more. And, and we all know in, in our market in Kenya, especially, we, we, we have a lot of instances where we have issues to do with delayed payments uh, or unfavorable trade terms uh, insofar as the buyers, uh, you know, because we are SMEs, right? So SME selling to a corporate, then you'd find that the corporate has, uh, you know, a trade term of say, what, 60 days, 30 days. So you find that sometimes you may have already serviced or delivered, but you're only waiting for money. So you really need a good bank that can work with you and help you uh, unlock those cash uh, because cash is king. We always say cash is king because of the cash flow. We need a cash flow. Without the cash flow, you cannot be able to do much. So we always need a good bank to help us unlock. So I always say, look at your your CRB positions, your your credit rating, you know, 
And, and I know DTB, if I walk in there as a DTB customer and I say I need an, I'm applying for a facility, I'm sure my manager, relationship manager working with me can always tell me what my credit position, uh, credit uh, CRB looks like. Even before they tell you, you would know because, you know, anybody you owe out there will always, you know, be calling you up for payments and all that. But it's always good to keep checking because there could be an, a long term old uh, debt that you took somewhere that you forgot about. Yeah, so it's always good to check. When my colleague Marion comes in next after me, she will be giving us uh, one of the ways that you can actually use a USSD code to find out, you know, what your credit positions, are, your CRB position looks like. So yes, so let's make ourselves look clean insofar as CRB is concerned, because then we look more attractive to the, to, to any banks. Um, so then borrow from few banks and lenders. Now, you know, this in this day and age, <laughs> we have bigger, bigger, bigger challenges than we used to have like 10 years ago. 10 years ago, because I was in the banking industry those days, the, the accessibility to credit was not as much. Even 15, yes, yes, 10, 10 years, it was not as much as it is now. Because today, if, if you're in need of funds, then you have all these uh, digital apps out there that you would, you know, just scroll up and borrow. Uh, but the challenge is, if you keep doing that, then what is happening is you're getting very expensive loans and many of them. The truth of the matter is, if you had one well-organized formal loan, say from a bank, then your cost of financing will be very low. Remember, we're looking at the profitability. We talked about the, the, the profit and loss statement being very critical for us. So... It is important for us to look at our bottom line. It's not just about accessing money. I know as SMEs, we want to get the, where we can get the money the fastest. Uh, sometimes you're not very price sensitive, but we need to get to become very price sensitive and uh, and, and just look at the least, the, 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 the most affordable loan, you know, or structure. So we encourage people because that's what we, we saw in the field. We, we actually came into contact with people, like one particular person had about 10, was it eight? My colleague Marion will even tell us more about this. We had a, a person who had about eight loans. One was from a bank, and the one in the bank was the one that was not performing, and then six others from digital lenders. And when we did the calculation, we we're like, hey, you know what? You're just better off working with your bank. It's much cheaper. Maintain the relationship there, and you'll be able to move much better. So in other words, we encourage you to borrow from few banks. Now, in my, I remember when my times that, uh, uh, you know, because at one point I was a branch manager and also a relationship manager, as, as Mantui mentioned, the, the clients that I would know, I'm the only one who's banking them or I'm the only one who has a credit facility on there for them. When it would come to end month and I'm looking at their debtors position, so they have a lot of money out there, they've not been paid, then I would really put a lot of my efforts and energies in making sure that they are able to get the access facility that they need to do to access or they're able to pay salaries. So banks also check that because they want to know, uh, you know, you know, because if you're banking with very few, the better for you because then you get that concentration that you need. Because I always say, if you want to grow, you have to have a, you know, a good relationship manager. And I'm very happy that DTB has come up with this product because that means they're very ready to work with you. So you just need to come in, work in with them and stick with one relationship manager let them know your business inside out. You do not even need to hire a finance manager because a good trained banker will always be able to give you very sound uh, advice financially and, on, and, and all that. And so that's one of the things we also learned. Uh, the, the, the other one we learned, the fifth one, is the payment of county licenses and taxes. Well, we always say, you know, you know one of the things the banks will ask you will be this. They'll ask you, hey, attach for me your county license approval. Uh, and then they will also want to go into your PIN and check on your tax position or tax status uh, on the back end. Because, you know, there's, you've signed. You've signed and you've applied and they have the authority to do that. They can go there and check how active you are. Are you paying your, 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 or you have issues with the taxman? So you'd find that if this is the case, then you're not looking attractive to the bank. Uh, and so... Or we say, hey, even if you're in a place where the county license, and I'll repeat this, even if you're in a place where the county government or the officers can't access your business, just pay because the banks will try to remove that risk 
uh, of non-payment of county licenses because you remember a county government can come and shut your business so they want to make sure that whatever money they give out there is not prone to be shutting down by county people and then also the government government can access all your funds uh by a letter <laughs> it's in the act so they also want to know are you up to date with your uh, uh your taxes so just be up to date with it i always say these county licenses and these taxes price them on your commodity it's not that money that you have to get into your pocket to pay you know if i am selling whatever i'm selling my margin should be able to cut up for these taxes it should be able to cut up for this it's part of your cost so that you maintain a profit at that level so when you do that then you become very attractive to the banks um so the other thing again was the age of business because we realize and we we are in a market and we know um banks are not necessarily lending to the you know uh, startups in that particular uh, state if i may use that word um they they like to lend to businesses that have been tried and tested but that's not even it the banks always look at the growth stage you know we we do have what we call the growth stage in businesses you can see on that slide um you have your startup you have a growing business you have a sustaining business there is a business that is declining and then decay so you can be sure a bank will never 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 give loan to a bank a business that is at decay stage and it would never give money to a business that is at decline stage unless there's a really justifiable reason as to why it's at the de uh, decline stage now you may ask yourself how would the bank know that this is where i am have you ever had, uh, seen uh, this is just a rhetoric question because i know you can't answer the banks always ask you for your three years bank statements so when you do give a three years bank statement, this is where they are placing you. I mean, like say for example, last year I did five million worth of sales. Previous year I'd done ten million worth of sales, and then the year earlier, two years earlier, I'd done fifteen millions. I mean, I'm on a decline, if not decay, kind of a, a stage. But if the past three years my revenues have been growing and my profitability growing, then I'm on the growing stage. Now. It's easy for a bank to decide to finance a business that's on the growing stage because when you're growing, uh, it means you, you have need for money and actual good use for the money because you're, you, you, you're growing. So it's, if it's stock, then you need stock to grow. Um, if you're at the sustaining stage, there's a problem because why do you really need the money unless you're selling on credit? Because if you're at a sustaining stage, then that means whatever you're selling, should be able to finance you because you don't need more right unless now you have you give the bank a very good reason as to why uh this happened like in the covid years the 2020s i know every other business was able to explain themselves out and the banks would be able to give them even if they look like as if as though they're in a decline but that's not a, a, a true decline and we always ask businesses by the time they're getting to the sustaining stage to try and re-engineer their business I like to use the, the example of a, a, a company that was selling, say, scratch cards. Now, scratch cards have been overtaken by so much by technology. These days, we are buying, you know, credit on airtime data just from from the suppliers themselves, from the air telcos themselves. So we don't need scratch cards. So at that time, if this business found out that it's in sustaining, then they needed to re-engineer and start doing newer products, newer everything, so they are able to start now looking good. So as a business owner, you need to understand at which stage am I? And what will help you understand besides your audited account, uh, calling in your accountant to come once a year to do your audited accounts, if you get an active application, like in this case, DTB is selling Infinity app, you, you know, giving you Infinity app options, then you see that you can always be looking at the app and saying, okay, this month, how are my sales like? Next month, you know, daily to day basis, how are my sales going? Then you're able to price yourself and make corrective actions. Do I need to re-engineer my business early? It is always important. Then this is the final one. Your business needs to be profitable. That's a fact. When a business is on a loss making position, then they're always in need for funding. Now, the banks will never fund a loss making business uh, because when they are funding a loss making business, it means they are funding the gap that has been generated by the loss position. And loss is just generally that, loss is just that, you're losing money. So, and by the time you, the business will start feeling some strain and what will happen is that you will rush to the banks to feel that strain and the banks will be able to detect that you're on loss making and they will not 
uh, fund you on that particular aspect, unless you have, again, another very, very strong reason, you know, was it as a result of a, a sudden shock? Was it COVID or was it a road that was being built outside my shop, but that road now has been finished? Now my food traffic will resume, you know, things like that. That's why you need to work with one particular bank. Like I say, don't, don't do many banks, just work with one particular bank, understand, let them understand you, let them know you. And then when you're realizing that you're on lost position, it's not the end. Start making corrective actions. Like we said, do I get a, a different supplier of my goods so that I can buy my goods at a less uh, price? Or do I uh, increase my prices if it's possible? Or do I change the product? Or do I, you know, it's, it, you become the businessman that you are, you know, decision making, corrective actions uh, that need to be made. And like I said, again, if you are able to track this on a daily basis, the better for you, uh, then you're able to make the corrective changes. You can imagine if you're realizing that you're, you've been selling at a loss one year down the line when the auditor comes, it's too late to change. But if you realize it the same day or the same month because you're using an active app, then what you realize is that you're able to change. You, you remember, it's not just we're not, we're not just moving volumes. We are selling at we must sell at a profit. So even if it means increasing your price, reducing the quantity of products that you're going to sell, but maintain a, a bigger, better looking profitability, then you're uh, in a good position. Uh, just before I move out, because for me, um, my part is done. Marion is gonna. We're gonna take a, about ten minutes break, and then Marion will come on bo uh, on board uh, to take us through the next part, which is really debt management. Is in and these are also findings that we got from the from the application that we did. Um, the infinity uh, done by DTB. There's a link that I think we shall be shared. They'll, they'll share with us the link because it's still under the you know pilot phase. So. In that particular instance, I think uh, the, the the administrator today, Mantui, will be able to give us that link so that whoever is interested can join in and then they'll be signed up and then just use it. And then let's see how that makes. I want to wish all your businesses success uh, as you grow. May you be able to access the funding uh, out there and just grow your business. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Mantui, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Collins, for an insightful part one of um, access credit readiness. Thank you so much um, um, for our attendees. You can share what has stood out for you. We've learned, you know, how to make sure that your your records are in order so that even when you go before banks, you are able to work with the relationship managers and the work and the and the various members of the of the banks on your journey on your growth journey. So as Collins has said, we will proceed for a 10 minute break and then we'll get into part two where we'll be led by Marion um, and promises to be also quite an enriching session. So let's get back at um, 10, we can say 10, 10.40. Yeah, so we'll be back at 10.40, stay tuned. Thank you. Welcome, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, from our short break. We just um, completed the first part of the credit readiness training by Collins, and we want to proceed to the second part. But just before I welcome Marion, I can see um, Elizabeth Kamau has her hand up. So I'll just unmute you. So Elizabeth, maybe you can try and... Let us know if you're able to speak. All right. I think, okay, we'll try and sort that. Meanwhile, maybe you can, oh, there we go. Um, so Elizabeth. Uh, good, good morning, I'm sorry. I think that was just uh, a mistake. I'm sorry for that. No, no, no problem, no problem, Elizabeth. So I think I see, Laban, you can see if that Laban, your hand is up. So maybe you can uh, try and raise your question. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Morning. Now, um, I was just concerned because the the previous uh the previous person said about um 
you know, keeping your your records straight so that even your bank could could follow about your your progress in the SME. Now, um, because some of the SMEs, uh, particularly I'd say like mine, I do not have a, you know, I would say a standard, a standard uh, worksheet or a, a, a workflow that adheres to the, you know, accounting, financial accounting, ethics and all that. But I have, um, you know, a customized, customized um, Excel sheets, which has the, which has the records, all my records, like incomes, expenses and such. But it did. I won't. I won't say it is a proper financial record, as part of a financial accounting uh, ethics and all that. How how do we go about it? And clear advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laban, for that great question. Um, I think we can we can have that question answered. Collins, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to handle it before now. We go to on to Marion's session. So let me just repeat that question, if if I may, I may, if I got it right. So the issue is he has um his data, but on an Excel sheet. Yes. Okay. And and so, mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. And I, sorry, I think also understanding is that maybe his and maybe Laban, you can also share the type of business, but that his business maybe may not be conventional in the way of even his record keeping. And so he wonders that even as he approaches a bank, mm -hmm. does it have to adhere to, you know, accounting standards, like strictly adhere to accounting standards? Okay, okay, good. So so what, what I'll say is this. Um the any 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 management accounts, in fact, when, whenever banks receive management accounts, they always insist on getting audited accounts. That, that's normally one of the things. So that we're saying, if as a bank, we're saying we want audited accounts for the financial years that have been finished. Like say, for example, if you're coming for a loan today, most SMEs don't have audited accounts for 2023, which is the year we are running on. So what will happen is that there will be a 2022, 2021 audited accounts now, with management accounts, now the records that now he has for this 2023 as per his what is called his management account. So a bank would use them, but based or supported by prior audited accounts uh, in that particular instance. So that, uh, you know, your management account might not have depreciation, you know, the, the few things that normally are added, but must be supported by prior year's audited account. So that then we are saying, this is management. And that's why even when, whenever there's a credit paper put, there will always be at a brackets capturing, this is audited, this is audited, and this is management. So yes, so as a business, you may present your management accounts, but must also be followed by audited accounts. I hope I've answered the question. Laban? Would... Yeah, sure. Thank you, okay. thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and also just to reiterate um, what Colin shared earlier on Infinity, that it is also a way, a product to sort of help um, you put your, your records in order. And so I know Gloria has shared on the chat and it's, it's in the pilot phase. So you can also explore that option in a bid to help you sort of put your records in order in a more structured manner. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laban and, and Collins. So now I'd like to welcome Marion so that she can take us through the second session of the Credit Readiness Stream. Karibu, Marion. Thank you very much, uh, Mantui and the DTB team. Uh, in collaboration with KBA, uh, like mentioned, my name is Marion, and it is an honor for me to take you through this second session. Uh, most welcome. Um, I'll take you through that. At the end of the session, we'll take uh, questions and answers for both part one and part two. And the DTB team will also be available to take on our questions. So uh, part two really builds on what Collins has already um, shared and taught us. And this is for business people who are now thinking, I might need uh, a loan. And so how do I go about it? What must I check to be sure that I'm ready? Or those who are aspiring to start businesses and when they get to the place where they need to borrow, how to just package themselves for this. So like Collins mentioned, we've, uh, we've been bankers previously. So kind of like we are sharing with you from an outsider, 
perspective, but we've been inside. So just the nuggets of how to go about it. Myself, I've also been in the credit decision making space. So pretty much giving you those um, secrets of how to go about um, your applications getting an approval and what to watch out for. So let's get into it. Mm, sorry, let me get to my slide a moment. Excellent. So, um, on the side. Okay, so how, what do lenders look out for when they're doing the uh, evaluation? So basically what we're talking about is the credit department in a bank or a lending institution has to do something we call the risk assessment. And there are many ways that the financials will do their risk assessment. And so we will take you through just one model that is considered when uh, considering who to finance, who to give time out until they are ready and who to decline. And so... Um, the model that we're looking at is called five C's of credit. And so this is just one way that the financiers will assess the credit department, the risk department will look at the loan applications coming through to determine whether to give a yes or a no. So um, the five C's of credit really, um, well, let me just make sure I can be able to do my slides. Sorry, one moment. Yeah, so the five C's of credit basically are, um, we'll, I'll take you through one by one. So we will look at the character of the borrower, the capacity of the borrower, the capital injection by the borrower, the collateral the, uh, the, the borrower is offering, and the conditions of the business environment. Um, so number one is character. So character, basically, you might wonder is uh, how would you know my character or what do you mean by character when you look at a borrower's application? Because first of all, the credit um, application doesn't will be approved by somebody who might not be the business relationship manager, the person who met you, the person who went to your site or to the best business premise. It's usually, for example, the file is sent to a head office department who are able to look at the file and review and make a decision. So character basically is looking at the commitment and the willingness of the borrower to repay the loan. We're looking at the individual's honesty, reputation and integrity. So your question might be, how would a Marion who sits at a head office somewhere be able to determine my reputation and integrity or honesty? So one of the ways that um, the credit department or a financial institution is able to assess character is by looking at the customer's previous repayment history. Now, if you have borrowed before in that same institution, the file will contain the, the, the loan applications, and in the system, they'll be able to tell that you paid well the last loans without delays. Um, probably on your loan statement, there might be uh, penalties that shows maybe you delayed to pay, therefore there's a uh, pointer towards late payment, or perhaps in your file there might be a demand letter, meaning your loan officer had to previously prompt you to make payment. Perhaps there might have been an auctioneer's letter saying this person didn't pay, therefore go collect and foreclose on their asset. So there, there are telltale signs on a file from a previous repayment history that will tell a financier whether the person has a good reputation, is honest, or has the integrity to, or the willingness to pay back a facility. Now, um, if you are new to a financial institution, Sometimes you will hear the, the financial asking you for loan statements from other, wherever you're banking currently, or your normal banking statements. Now, if it's a loan statement, they are looking out for the same things. They are looking at, uh, did you pay within the repayment period? Did you pay early? Were there penalties? So the same things I would be looking at in other financial uh, institutions, loan statements where you borrowed before. Um, if if you've never borrowed before, this is your first time and you're just uh, putting in your application for the first time, then like Colin said, your, your banking's 
or how you 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 operate your operative account, your current account will also be a key indicator on whether you have been operating well. Number one is another thing we look at is, for example, issuing of checks that bounce. So basically, that would mean that you you picked a product or you were offered a service by somebody. You give them a promise to pay or a tool of um, a payment instrument of a check. Perhaps it was a post data check and you told them, I'll pay you for your goods in a week's time, bank on this date. The person went and deposited the check and the check bounced, maybe with a reason insufficient funds. That means that you are not honest with the person to have advised them accordingly. So bounce checks in, 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 in your operative accounts usually are also um, an indicator of whether you're relating well or your willingness and commitment in terms of debt outside of the institution. This would be this would be with other people. So those are some of the things that a credit department will be able to analyze and assess and determine whether a person is credit worthy or not. The other thing is uh, you've had this CRB um, mentioned so many times um, before. So for the CRB, basically, um, many of you have had it. It's a credit reference report, and it comes from the credit reference bureaus. Currently, if I'm not wrong, there are three of them. So some of you have never seen one. So usually, we just advise you, if you send the letters CR, meaning credit report, to the number 21272, you will be prompted on um, the next message that will come in will be um, uh, give us your email address. Then well, as soon as you text the email address back to that number 21272, you'll be able to immediately get your CRB report on your email address. So for some it's straightforward, others you might see there's a fee of maybe 50 bob, but that's just a healthy way of knowing where you stand in terms of your credit history and how other financials have booked your repayments. So that's an important tool to look at and check. Perhaps you might be even a, a, a co-borrower or a joint partner with another company and you find that company is listed, therefore your name is also appearing on a report somewhere. So this is one way to just look at your own CRB report and be empowered to know how to handle. Um, so uh, sorry, character, as we have said, is just being able to um, determine a person's ability to repay, look at their account conduct and their history and determine whether it's good or bad and that will be um, a determinant on how to proceed. Number two, the second C, that the first C we were talking about was character and you remember we talked about five Cs. So I'll quickly take you through. So the second one is conditions. So conditions basically refer to the industry factors or business environment in which a business is operating. So you'll find sometimes when you put in your application in the bank, it might take a while because you're wondering, I thought you dare say 24 hours, but sometimes it takes a credit analyst as they are doing the assessment to look at different um, uh, industry factors to be able to give a decision whether to proceed with the application or not. So basically, I will just look at that one factor, which is uh, the environment, which if you've studied business, there's an acronym of PESTEL. And so I will quickly take you through what that would mean in an example in terms of analysis for conditions. So PESTEL basically means it's an acronym for political, environmental, sociological, technological, legal, and uh, environmental and legal factors that can affect a business environment or the industry factors. So for example, when we're looking at a customer's file for to check conditions like political, we'll be looking at Lately, what has changed in terms of, for example, taxes, you find um, um, people who do digital content now, they, these are withholding tax of 5% that would determine maybe your revenues or net um, earnings at the end of it. So what has changed politically that would affect your business? Um, we would look at um, if it's economical, how is a shilling um standing against the dollar in today's times. For example, you're an importer, you've always brought in stuff from overseas and uh, the quantity you're bringing is probably less for the same amount of money or will you need to increase your prices to make a good margin? So the economic factors in the, um, in the business environment also matter in terms of even business advisory. Like we would be able to speak to you and tell you, I think based on this and this, 
perhaps your business might need to change one or two things. Sociological is just understanding um, what has changed today with the market in our space in Kenya, in Nairobi, wherever you're operating Mombasa. So you find like in business today, most um, we are told that the fastest and most effective way socially or on social media to market and promote your product say, is via TikTok, for example. So are you in that space to be able to push your product, wrecking uh, higher revenues? So sociologically, what has changed? Maybe you find today people are using even uh, uh, social, they're called them um, influencers to promote their products. So is it something you are able to do to push you know, um, shoppers are buying online. They are not leaving their homes to go and collect a product here and there. So those are some of the things that socially we would be able to look at and see how are you presenting your case to us to see that you're able to um, get the revenues to pay the installment. Remember, all this we are doing is an analysis of the borrower to see whether they have the ability to pay back the loan. You know, so how have you presented yourself? to be able to showcase that you're able to pay back technologically. Again, we're just saying people are digital. Do you have the payment gateways that allow the customers to pay digitally? You know, whether it's online, you know, how have you, how are you aligning yourself technologically to be able to meet the customer's demands? Legally, if you're borrowing, for example, you're giving a house, a property, land, uh, you will find the laws changed some time back to ensure that there's spousal consent for signing the charge documents, the legal documents. So those are some of the legal factors. Are they available to sign? Will they be willing to sign depending on the um, security? So it's just really about understanding the legal laws around the business and the environment. Environmentally, are you complying? Like now we know there's a tree planting day, you know, it's a direction the country wants to go. Are we aligned in those kind of things? Are you building in riparian land, for example, or is your business in a place that does not comply, maybe carbon emissions and stuff like that? So depending on the type of business and the industry, the credit department does look at the pastel to be able to determine whether a business is good to go or not. Um, capacity. Capacity is the other thing that there's a third C that we're looking at. Capacity is basically the ability of a business to borrow. And Collins has emphasized this and has already taken us through. So basically, we're looking at um, if a customer has is borrowing a certain amount of money, I think I have a slide on that. For example, your sales is 125000 in a month. And the cost of goods for what you're selling is 50,000. So you have a GP or a gross profit of 75. And after you have taken out your operating expenses, rent, salaries, airtime, transport, what have you, this is just a simple example, you have a net profit of 40,000. So if you're coming to borrow a facility whose installment is like 50K per month, then clearly the business does not have ability or you do not have the capacity to pay the installment in a month. But if you're putting in an, an, an application whose installment would be like 20,000, so we are like, ah, this person already has something left over that can be able to help them repay the facility. So capacity is the third C. And our fourth C is capital. Capital basically is down payment or um, a person's skin in the game. In the sense, how serious are you with the um, application that you're putting through. So for example, you might have a person who's putting up an, a, an apartment and um, they want to borrow to, 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 to finish. So from a banker or financial perspective, we look at um, maybe you're coming in and saying, I already bought the piece of property. I've already done ground floor. I've already done first and second floor. I only have the third and the fourth to finish. So in terms of capital, it means that the person has already put in their own shareholder funds or their own deposit that is sufficient for them to really, um, they care for the, the project that it should succeed because should the project fail, then they will have lost a lot of money. So that's like a partnership. It's not just the banks or the financiers uh, liability 100%. It's shared. You already have something you've put in. You just want the financial to top up for you. So that's why you'll always find whether it's an asset finance or a purchase of a property or an equipment, the financial will always say, 
let's say your deposit, you have a 10%, 20%, 30% deposit. So that usually is considered like the capital or an investment into the project, which would be, um, which shows that you're serious about the project and the borrowing as well. So capital is usually a very important um, thing the financials look out for that you're also vested. You're also keen on ensuring that your part doesn't fail so that even the financial putting in their investment that really you're gonna put in your best foot forward. Or if you have an LPO, you already have some money. Like maybe your LPO is to supply something for a million shillings. And really the cost of doing the job would be 500K. So it's not like you need the whole 500K from the financial. You already have 200 and you need a 300 to be able to cover the cost. So capital is a very important um, consideration when looking at the assessment of the application. And then collateral is the, um, the fifth and final C that we're looking at today. So collateral basically is a pledge, the asset you're pledging to the financial as a fallback. Um, should there be a um, situation that the financial has a fallback? Remember, the financials usually um, use the depositors' funds to lend. So they must be able to ensure that when they lend out the money, it shall come back based on the loan agreement. And in the worst case scenario, that, that there will be a um, way to recover or um, foreclose on something to be able to cover the money that has been given out. So I hope you understand that that's a reason why really the financials would want a fallback, a pledge, an asset, a collateral against the money that they lend out. There are uh, facilities that are collateral free, free, sorry. So we know for employed people, you can get financing against your pay slip, but many business loans are backed by a collateral but do speak to your financial, speak to DTP here and see is there a type of uh, facility that can be granted without a tangible security. The other thing to mention here is, and we believe DTP is also a part of, is there's usually a government um, um, uh, collaboration that comes to help women, the disabled and the youth, because many of those in that category may not have collateral in their names. So there's the Africa Guarantee Fund and there's usually the credit guarantee schemes where the bank, the government uh, provides a way in which if, for example, the collateral requirement was to cover a certain amount, amount of money, the government is able to come in and cover even up to 50% of the collateral requirement. So I urge you to speak to your financial, speak to the bank here, DTB, and find out, do you guys have an AGS, AGF scheme, scheme or a collateral guarantee scheme that you could benefit from? So there are ways, should you be stranded in terms of collateral, there are ways based on if you've passed on your character, you've passed on your conditions, you've passed on your capacity and your capital and collateral really is the only thing that you're struggling with. Uh, do not despair. There are ways around collateral should you be stranded. Um, so those are the five C's that if you forget anything, Remember those five C's that credit always looks at to be able to determine a client's ability to repay or, 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 or not. Like assessment of the credit application is based on these five C's. So like we mentioned, types of collateral, but it's dependent on the type of facility that it could be land, it could be fixed deposit, could be vehicles. There are really a number of them which you can speak to your relationship manager and be able to determine what works best for the amount you're borrowing or the type of facility you're borrowing. Next, I want us to cover something we call debt management. Um, so debt management basically is um, having a debt strategy. So it's just a way to get your debt under control and this is very important as you're getting to borrow, as you've already borrowed and perhaps trying to find wisdom around how to work out your facility. A debt strategy is very important for every business person and even an individual. So we will look at it in two ways. You can do debt uh, assessment two ways. You can do it personally. So you can evaluate your personal debt position by looking at your assets and liabilities. 
Basically, Collins has already kind of covered this, but we're looking at it from a, a point of just assessing for yourself, where do you stand in terms of your uh, debt position? So the best way to look at it is number one, look at its asset base. Number one, we're looking at how to look at your asset base and evaluation. So for asset base, you can assign value to all your assets. Look at, um, do you have land somewhere in Kamulu or wherever? Do uh, you have some buildings? Maybe the house you live in is your property or in Shags or wherever it might be. You have some vehicles, you have some assets. You just assign a value to all the assets that you may own, cash in the bank, um, monies in fixed deposits. Um, hi, hi, Marion, sorry. Yes. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. We've just received um a request. If yeah. you can if you can slow down just a bit, I think so that um our attendees are able to just digest the really good um information that you're sharing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll take it slow. So um in terms of um asset-based valuation, so this is really looking at what you own vis-a-vis -vis what you owe. So that way you'll be able to determine your net value, your net worth. So like I said, to do the assets, you look at everything that you own in terms of assets. It could be land. You'd put a value to it. It could be land in Shags, land in Nairobi, land somewhere. You put a value to that. Then number two, you can look at perhaps you have some building, the house you live in, assign a value to that. Maybe it's 5 million shillings, you put a value to it. Maybe you own a vehicle, you can say, I have one vehicle, two vehicles, I have a motorbike, whatever it might be, you assign a value. So this way you're doing, uh, you're assigning a value to all your assets. Then when you have assigned your, your assets some value, you look at the liabilities. So what do you owe? You know, I have a loan at the bank, the balance is this. I have borrowed from family. The balance is this. So when you accumulate all your liability values against your assets, the difference is what tells you your net worth. So if it's a positive uh, figure, then you're good. You're doing a, you're doing well. Your debt management strategy is good. But if it is a negative figure, meaning that your liabilities outweigh your assets, then it means that you're at risk of being insolvent. So this is a way of evaluating your personal debt. Yeah. So very important to be able to do it for yourself. Another way to be able to um, check your position is income-based. Yeah. So income-based basically is how much revenues you, 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 you have vis-a-vis -vis your expenses. And so like I we gave the example previously, if you have a facility or a debt or you're looking to borrow, for example, 100,000 shillings, and when you're given through your amortization, another thing maybe you can take note of is on your phone, you can be able to download an amortization calculator. Amortization calculator is something that can help you compute how much your installment can be. So you can go playing and say, if I'm to borrow 500K for 12 months and you know what interest rate your financial is providing, then the installment will be X amount of money. So that helps you know, okay, if I borrow a million bob and they give me one year to pay, can I afford 100K or 85 or 110,000, whatever the installment will be based on the interest rate. So an amortization calculator is a good thing to have. So the example we're giving is, as you're looking at your income base, you're looking at, say, I want to borrow 100K, and my financial is going to give me only six months, the installment is likely to be about 8,500. Now, how much am I, am I able to pay 8,500 if I only make 10K in a month? Yeah. So this 10K is your gross. Then, you know, you still haven't deducted your operating costs. You haven't deducted your rent. You haven't deducted your you know, the person, if it's a very small business, this is probably a mama boga or something like that. So you'll find 8,500 might be on the higher side if 10,000 is your gross profit. However, if it's your net, you can consider. So basically, income base is looking at how many, how much revenue you're generating vis-a-vis -vis your liabilities. So this is personal evaluation. With this, you're able to tell, yes, I think I can manage that kind of installment if I go to my bank and um, they will be able to approve. Now, should you find doing a personal debt evaluation is tedious or difficult, 
then you might be able to consider going to your bank to do this assessment for you. So you can do basically it's called we call it a free evaluation. So basically what you do is you just visit your bank, go to your branch, let them know you're desiring to borrow for this purpose. The very important thing is purpose. Like why are you borrowing? The bank will be able to do an assessment for you. You know, they have the digital platforms, the artificial intelligence uh, ability to be able to plug in and do all these things. And when they come back to you, you know, they will run the CIP reports, they will do all the analysis, check all your financial statements, like Collins mentioned, your balance sheet, your P&L, your cash flows, you know, um, they'll be able to tell you, yes, you can qualify for this much if you give us this type of collateral or based on all the five Cs, the bank will be able to come back and give you feedback. Now, should they come back with a negative report and tell you, sorry, you're not able to qualify, very important to be able to ask why, yeah, ask for the reason so that they tell you, one, perhaps you're not banking adequately, like Collins explained, you if you run an overdraft, you must be able to see it fluctuate. You know, it should not always be, um, you know, in a, a debit position for a long time. You should be able to swing to credit or you have a bounced check somewhere and they fear that perhaps that's a trend. So ask for the reasons. Take it like a doctor's report. Whatever the, 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 the financial tells you is a reason for your decline, please take it positively with reasons. You know, they'll tell you bank for another six months, what you're explaining physically or what we have seen on ground does not reflect on your bank statements. Then you need to um, take it positively and say, okay, fine, give me six months. I'll be able to rectify one or two or three things to be able to be in good books. So always take the why, ask the why, list, get the reasons down, follow through, then come back and say, yes, I have been able to qualify because the thing is debt is good like Collins began by asking is debt good or bad debt actually is a leverage because um you could decide I will build my apartments once I have saved up in the next 10 years and put them up but should you just do the few things that we're telling you to do you will find that when you qualify you'll be catapulted you know, you'll be able to do your buildings in a very short while, get back um, some revenues, clear your facilities, move to the next one. Um, and so that is a good thing and it's a leverage. So the important thing is if you're not able to do your personal evaluation, uh, just assessing your assets and liabilities, assigning value, knowing your net worth or doing your uh, income based evaluation on your revenues and, and 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 expenses to determine whether you have enough left over to repay then your your banker your financier can be able to walk you through and guide you so um very important so even as we look the next thing we want to look at is credit worthiness so we've talked about this credit worthiness and let us break it down a bit further so in a book um that um is recommended um for many business people amongst many good books is one by Steve Covey that's called The Speed of Trust. Um, one of the things he says amongst many, many nuggets that he puts in his book is um, the ability to borrow is one of the biggest assets an individual or an organization can have. Yeah, the ability to borrow, like to go to the bank or your financial and to be told approved. That's a big asset that we will never take for granted because the flip side is also, I guess, quite painful. If you've ever gone to a bank thinking you're qualified, you're told no. Uh, yeah, the feeling is not very nice. So take it that building a good name for yourself to be worthy of credit is an asset. Mm -hmm. Like you're the one to tell the bank, no, I'm not borrowing now. I'll borrow in six months, I'm okay. So that's a very important thing to build on. So it's a privilege, it's a great opportunity to be able to borrow. So the ability to have a debt strategy against a good credit worthiness is where we are striving to be as business people. Um, so in terms of debt, you'll find like Colin said, in, our, in, in the day we live today, credit is kind of very easily available on uh, digital platforms, um, the banks will be calling to say um, we can approve in 24 hours, you know, so it feels like the credit is accessible. So what makes the difference between the rich and the poor in our society today 
in terms of credit. So all of us are, are have the ability to access debt. So you'll find even with the, um, uh, I forget the name, even the Mshwaris, they are there on our phones. Um, they are all available to us. So the difference is the rich people, they borrow a lot. You know, these are the ones who come in looking for con, uh, for syndicate loans where even financiers come together to do um, a big facility. Maybe somebody wants to build a city in Nakuru or they want to put up a mall, you know, so they need a lot of financial injection. Many people who do such big projects, it's not that like they've been saving forever to do a mall. A lot of them have good relationships with their financiers. So they borrow big time. The risk is big and also their returns are big. So they have calculated, they know I have some down payment, my capital is in place, I've already purchased the property, I've sunk my foundation, I've done 15 floors, I need another 15 floors in this small. And the bank is able to do the, you remember the projections and the cash flow projections Collins took us through. So you see the projections will show in the month 15, I'll be able to have recovered enough money to pay back the installment, you know, unclear, you know, even though the financial might ask, are you sure about occupancy, for example? So you've already done your analysis. Remember, we've done our conditions. We know that in a certain region, um, there are many businesses that can be able to take up space. And therefore, even though I have only 50% occupancy, based on how much money I've already injected in the project, I'll be able to repay the installment. If you just give me this amount of money, I'll be able to have, even with 50% occupancy, enough money to pay the installment. So the people who um, make it big time also be, take big risks, big projects, big returns, and that works for them. And the poor, unfortunately, with the... Um, with the the small monies that we take on the phone, people take that amount of money, 1,500 for consumption. And you'll find the smaller facilities in those kind of, um, uh, those type of facilities are very expensive. So the poor people, unfortunately, even pay higher interest rates. And now they don't put that money to generate any revenues. You see, it's for consumption. And Collins already alluded to it. If there's anything you will want to remember from this training is if you're to go to the financier to borrow, don't borrow for consumption, borrow for production. Let the money that you put in go into a money-making venture that will be able to cover for itself and give you a return at the end of it. So let it never be, um, I'm going to borrow to buy my bed to sleep on. No. If I'm going to borrow to buy a bed, I better be selling that bed at an, a higher price. You know, so whatever it is that you're borrowing, remember to borrow for production and not really for consumption, because really that's what makes the difference between the rich and the poor. Um, another thing, okay, in the same line, because we picked up a bit of uh, frequently asked questions from some of the trainings we've had before, and it's good to just put it here, even as we discuss credit readiness, is if a person is asking, I used to have a good track record or my business collapsed or I lost my job and now when I check my CIP report, I have a negative listing. How do I redeem myself? How do I get back to the good books of my financial? So yes, there is a way of coming around. All hope is not lost. We always say, one, look at how you can do a loan renegotiation. A loan renegotiation basically means you go back to your financial, explain yourself. Anytime something goes wrong in the business and you're not able to meet your obligation, be the one to call. Don't wait for the financial to call you asking, how come you, you passed to due? Why didn't you pay? Come out yourself. When you know your installment is due on every fifth, and fifth is here and you haven't deposited the funds or you haven't made good your installment, be the one to call your RM, your relationship manager. Let them know I'm stuck for one or two reasons. I would like to explain myself. Give me a day or two. Give me one week. My, my, my clients say they would pay. They have delayed. So be the one to go ahead. But should this be a long overdue facility that is already negatively listed in their books, then you may want to come and explain. Remember, you must have a strategy. It's not just about asking them to book it afresh. 
So in our example, we're saying if you had a loan that you were paying for, say, five years, and you already paid two years down the line, and then things went south, and you've not been able to recover, but now you've come back, and perhaps then you used to pay 150000 per month, and uh, the business collapsed, but now you have restarted, and you have something that can give you 50k you go back to your financial and say now i have 50,000 would you consider 50 many times some money is better than nothing so you want to offer something bring something to the table for the financial to be able to um consider you know something is better than nothing so they will see oh this person already paid two years so perhaps we can stretch back the loan back to five years and see that this 50k can cover something so they can book it afresh with a lower installment because you already had made a partial payment towards the facility. So that's really one of the ways if you have a good understanding financial, which I believe DTB is, better come back to them and explain yourself, come with a plan, a proposal, and you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised that you'll be given an, a new lease of life. Um, but the other thing as a borrower, you do not want to keep a facility for too long because the longer you keep the facility, the more interest rate you're paying. So even though they book it afresh for you for another five years, Remember, you don't have to pay a whole five years. The sooner you can offset your facility, the better for you, the better you're able to just um, pay off, reduce the amount of interest you're paying for your own business sake. But if you need it for the long term, the financials are usually able to um, support that. Sometimes it's a buy-off. Should you be in a situation where your financial that you're currently with is not in a position to listen to your story, or you are gone too long for them to consider you honest or um, reliable, you may want to consider a debt purchase, which perhaps you can say, uh, let me look for uh, my banker where maybe I've been banking there uh, um, in the last couple of months, explain to them, give them a collateral, show them your plan, how much revenues you're making. They may be able to clear the facility that's on the other side and book for you, um, a facility that you can be able to comfortably pay um, maybe cheaper. Some people have taken circle loans to clear bad debts with their financials where they've been, able, they've, they've been stuck. So that's a way to be able to come out of a, a bad credit situation. The other way is should you be in a completely at a loss of no renegotiation, no one is purchasing your debt, Sometimes you may want to dispose your asset, start disposing, because you might find maybe the particular asset is already attached to the financial. Look for a buyer for yourself. Maybe your relatives might be more understanding in terms of giving you a good price rather than offsetting at an auction. So you might start looking for buyers. And if you find a buyer, you speak to your bank through their debt collection department and they'll be able to get, you know, that would be a better return on the asset than just disposal to highest bidder. So sometimes, or dispose of another of your assets to be able to clear this facility for the sake of redeeming your credit worthiness. So these are some of the ideas which you can consider should you find yourself in a situation where you have a bad um, debt that has been stuck. Yeah, so speak to your financial, look at some of these options, but always bring something to the table. That way you'll be able to be considered. Um, so well, some of the tips when you're already in the in, in, in a debt situation and you feel you need some wisdom around it is you can consider one of the things we call snowball method. This is where if you have multiple facilities and you're feeling overwhelmed, you can decide pay off the smallest debt first, you know, because sometimes when you do uh, a, a payoff, you feel motivated. There's a confidence boost. It's a quick win. So you pay the smallest debt first. Uh, if possible, and then pay minimum amounts on the other debts. So you see, when you knock off one, you feel like, oh, one down, three to go. So that helps some people in their confidence in terms of uh, being able to clear and offset debts that are overwhelming. The other one is called a debt avalanche. That's the other way around. Hope I'm not going too fast. So for the debt avalanche is where you pay the largest one first, if possible, the largest and the most expensive debt. So you look at it and you say, let me clear the biggest one. And once you have that, then it's a confidence booster. You know, you've gotten rid of the biggest interest. Uh, and so you can you pay minimum amount on the other smaller ones. And the other option would be like a debt consolidation. You can find um, you have multiple facilities. Um, 
And so you, you, you prefer, you may not be able to pay off a small one or pay off the biggest one, but you can bring everything together, speak to your financial, of course, backed with um, a, 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 a payment plan and a collateral perhaps. You just tell them, consolidate everything, book a fresh, let me start a fresh, because if there are many and you're unable to keep up with which one falls due at what point, what goes um, on which day. So sometimes a debt consolidation is a good way to just um, get your debt situation in, in order. Remember, we're talking about um, debt management, having a debt strategy, so that if you find yourself in a corner somewhere, um, these are some of the things you can apply to help you um, be able to proceed better. Um, another thing uh, we hear a lot is, is a credit card good or bad? You will find yes and no is the answer to this question. Yes, a credit card is good in a financially prudent person's hand because you'll find if you're able to calculate the days when you need to pay interest, you will find some financials have even up to 50 days of interest-free credit on cards. Like if you know by this date I need to have paid, you will have used your money, paid back in good time and find you have saved. You have saved quite a bit. Like um, should you have a credit card, but many times this applies a lot to employed people, but should you find yourself with a credit card and you have a quick order and you're sure your supplier will be able to pay back within 30 days, you have history, you know how this works. You go, if it's furniture, whatever you're going to collect to supply, run your credit card, pick your goods, deliver with an invoice. And within 30 days, if your client has been able to pay you, you'll find you have actually spent zero money on a credit card. So it's for the financially prudent persons. And it's a wonderful tool to have. It's a good backup to have um, in, in a situation where you know it's readily available and no obviously if you decide to be imprudent with a card the interest rates will run you to the ground you know because you must be able to anticipate and um, put to good use that facility if you use it for consumption remember for consumption is what will get into into trouble but if you use it for production then you're in good hands and the credit card is, is, is good for your business and for yourself. So just remember production and not for consumption is best. Then, um, um, so what we will look at is the nuggets as, as we're coming to a close is number one, remember that debt is a leverage. It is a very good tool to catapult you to the next heights, to the heights, to your dreams, if you have a good debt strategy. And that's what we're saying is you borrow for production and not for consumption. And always remember to have an exit strategy. The debt must be paid. Every time you sign a loan contract, ask yourself, why am I borrowing? What is the purpose of this facility? Um, how am I going to utilize this money? Make sure there's no diversion of funds. Um, make sure you don't, um, and that's really what we're talking about on my next slide. But know that the debt must be repaid. Every time you click take loan, you know, whether it's a digital facility you're taking, always have at the back of your mind, how am I going to pay back? Because the debt must be paid. Then um, our no-nos basically are the funds cannot be diverted. If you say you borrowed for patches of stock, or uh, increase of uh, expansion of your business, really you have to be so cautious not to be caught up in any other activities that might take away the funds because the minute the money is not put to the purpose it was intended, then you're already in trouble from the get-go because it was supposed to generate funds and now it's not 100%, it's 90%. So you already have to cover for a 10% deficit. You know, for small business people, where they say if you have money in your bank, that's not the time when people say we have a fundraiser for one, two, three, that you just send money because you'll find yourself in big trouble. Then no multi-borrowing. Remember, you can only try as much as possible to stick with one lender because they will understand your, your needs. They'll be able to tailor make uh, the right products for you. Like Colin said, um, when his customers come to him and um they know for sure he's they are like Collins is his own their only uh, lifeline. Then he's able to prioritize their needs and see how to push for approvals for their needs. So this way, 
you, you're covered better when you really just try and consolidate your borrowing. And so far we've seen our partners to DDTB are quite um, a good uh, partner to have. So consider them, send, um, consolidate your banking with them and they'll be able to give you some good solutions. So only go where to other financials if a product you need for the business is not available with where the person you're currently um, of banking with. Because um, I remember at one point um, when we used to finance vehicles at Toyota, we used to say, um, leave all your motor um, problems with us. You know, if you need land, if you need work in capital, go to the financial. So you only go to another lender where that solution is really not provided. Again, we always say don't overstock if you if you have um your business is trading, consider the seasons. You see, like very in this December is really many times when people either miss their calculations on stock. You know, so perhaps this is when you need to really have the stocks, depending on what you sell for Christmas. This is when you really need to have done your projections nicely to make sure your goods will move now when people have a 13th salary or they have a bonus or a, the vouchers people are given for Christmas. This is really the time when you look and you say now is the time and the season when people gift one another. So stocking is very critical and you do not want to overstock in a season when people are not buying the type of goods you buy you know like you know now is where textbook centers and bookshops really are stocking quite a bit because this is when the uptake for the next year's um, um, academic year this is when schools are buying books parents are buying books uniforms so you wouldn't find someone having a big container media in june you know, so stocking and when to stock, how much to stock is a critical part, even when you're borrowing for that purpose. Because if you take so much facility for stock and then it doesn't move, then you're in trouble already with your financial. Then remember, again, we will re-emphasize that in this meeting, we don't think there are people who are planning to defraud the banks. Whatever you borrow, please make sure you, you pay back. So I want to appreciate you for your time. And um, we will take uh, questions and answers for both Collins and myself um, from this moment. Mantui, you are to help us with that. And thank you for that. Thank you so much, Marion. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Oh, great, great. I think that was such can see even from the claps and the hats um, that has really landed well and it was very practical so so thank you so much Marion thank you so much Collins um, I'd like also to just um, introduce we have one of our senior leaders from the business banking team just before we go get into the Q&A session um, so I'll hand over to Ellie who is with um, Roy just for that introduction before we go to the Q&A thank you Sorry, Mantui. Um, come again. One Sorry, I um, was just saying we, we are joined by one of our senior leaders at business banking. I know um, you, you're sharing the sound. So just hand over to you for, for that brief introduction before we get into the QA session. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Morning. Yeah, yeah my name is Roy Onsongo from business banking department. Assistant Chief Manager. Great. Thank you so much, um, Roy, and for joining us. And so Roy will also assist us in, in responding to some of the questions that we are receiving on the Q&A tab. For, for additional questions, please just direct them there. Um, and so we'll have uh, Josiah helping us through the questions. Um, he'll assist us in reading. So some of them are directed to Collins, some to Marion, and some to Roy. Um, but for, for all of you, for Roy, for Marion and Collins, please do chip in where you where you, you have insights to add on to the questions. We'll really appreciate. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Avanti. So I will uh, start with the first question. Um, and I would invite any of the panelists to, to respond. 
Uh, the first question comes from uh, Melita Sokelo. And, uh, the question asks, if someone is owing you money and has been uh, three years without paying, uh, is it still an asset? Um, maybe I can, um, I would say there's an aging, a debtor's aging. So usually you, 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 you check one week how many people owe you and haven't paid within a week, within 30 days, within 90 days, 120. By the time it's three years, usually in our um, um, rating of aging of debt, it's really like a loss position or really it's considered non-recoverable. So you may eventually have to write off, yeah, but how you, you need to have already put in place measures, like what is your debt collection strategy as a business? You know, um, as you give money to a person, what is your fallback? The same way the bankers will not just give money without thinking what will happen if this person doesn't pay back in three years. You also, as a business, you need to understand if I give credit to my customer and they don't pay back within three years, do I write off? You know, so you need to have a, a debt collection strategy as a business, small as you might be. Um, so I wouldn't say it's still an asset. By now, I think it's a write off. Yeah, if they have not shown any any way of paying back, they've not responded to your letters, demand letters or um, calls, or you've not, I mean, they don't receive you anymore if you visit them. So some of them, if they are promising, perhaps if there's a strategy they've given you and for sure you think in year three they'll come back, you could consider an asset, but mostly many times business is right off and then you just, it'll be a, a profit later. If should they give you back, then you'll write it back in your books. Yeah. Oh, thank you very oh, much, Maria, for that. That is really profound. Um, we will go on to the next question just so that we also handle as many questions as possible. And uh, this goes to Collins. Uh, and the question says, from your presentation uh, to Collins, uh, having many loans from different bodies at the same time, uh, from that presentation, uh, from your point of view and experience that you have, how can one uh, be helped to come out of these loans? Like having... Uh, many loans from different bodies at the same time. Collins? You're right. Well, that's a great question. Uh, actually, the best thing to do normally is ultimately, if you have, say, six people who have lent you, um, look at all the six individually, find out which one has the least cost to you, like which is the least price. Because remember, you're in business. And the interest you're, charge, you're paying is an expense to your business. So you want to look at which is the most, the least expensive, uh, in other words, most affordable. Then, hopefully, because most of the times it will be a bank, the one that is least affordable would highly likely be the bank. Approach that bank. You know, we always say when you're talking to bankers, just talk to them like your doctors. You know, like you say everything, don't hide anything, just tell them. So they can be able to give you a good structure. When you hide a little bit here and there, then your, the solution they give you will not help you in totality. Like in this case, go to approach the bank and say, okay, listen, I have so much, so many other loans. I'd like to consolidate it. And you explain to them because you explain to them with these six loans that I have, I am paying on all of them, as you can see. But I'm better off consolidating them to you who is the cheapest and then again on a longer term, because what normally happens with loans, remember, the longer the loan, the less the required repayment and cash is king. So if I have six loans and all of them are short term in nature, so you, I'll find that I'm actually paying so much more compared to if I was I consolidated them into one, which was a cheap loan and was a longer term. So you explain to your bankers and let them know, hey, listen, if it's DTB, you go to DTB and say, I have so many loans. These are them. These are the list of the loans people who are giving us. Even when DTB pulls up the CRB, they'll see it. Some loans are not in the CRB. Like say, for example, family loans or loans to friends are not there. But like I said, explain to them everything. Show them all the loans you have. Then they consolidate them because they'll be happy to consolidate, especially if they are holding maybe a collateral that has way much, much more value than the current loans that you have if combined. Or if you have 
a collateral that you can give them because the reason why the bank loans are normally cheaper than these others is because obviously of the risk and the collaterals held. So you'll find that a bank with a collateral, yes, it's there, collateral, but it's a cheaper facility, then go for them for consolidation. So that's what I'll advise. You do not have to look for money from your business to pay on all those loans and then now start afresh because then again, it might strain your business. So uh, banks will understand that you're just managing your cash flow and let's let's also understand that the banks always have uh they're in business they have targets they have uh, relationship managers who have targets to lend out so if you're a good um borrower and you have demonstrated you're paying on all the other loans even if you're struggling on them you can explain to them listen i'm struggling on these other loans because they're all short term and the repayment is high but if i come to you the repayments will go much lower and you'll be comfortable within my inflows. So I encourage you just to walk into DTB, talk to them and see how they can consolidate. Thank you very much for that, Collins. I can see even the responses from the chat that uh, people are saying, thank you for uh, that detailed response. So the third question uh, goes to Roy. Uh, uh, good morning. That's uh, the question. Good morning. Does DTB have credit facilities for clients who uh, would borrow uh, build real estate and when paying back the client and DTB have a predetermined percentage in terms of rent until when the loan is repaid. Uh, that is so that our DTB clients can grow. Uh, Roy, do you want to respond to that? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we do really construction loans. But however, the owners for the repayment comes from the customer. Customer has to look for the people who are buying if, the, if it is for to sell after that then the payments are made we, then we clear the loan sharing we we don't manage a re repayment thank you thank you thank you for that probably you can couple that question with another question that i've just seen so we just uh, uh move from that point uh, once uh, the question says uh did uh Hello to DTB. Under what circumstances does the bank rearrange payments uh, schedules for a customer without making it as a bad debt? Roy? In, sorry, for what, what the? Now uh, the question asks, if, uh, what under what circumstances does the bank uh, rearrange the payment schedule for a customer without making it a bad debt? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, now it depends on uh, what is the underlying condition, why, what the customer is undergoing. Like now, sometimes, like when we had COVID, uh, some customers, some uh, depending on what industry they are, they were not able to make payments. So for example, in the hotel industry, the airlines were shut down. They were not able to get their customers. So we will have to look at their cash flows. Then uh, we need to, to understand the industry they are in. Then we can advise on how we can rearrange their repayments. All right, thank you so much. And I would uh, highly encourage uh, other participants, please, if you have a question, just post it on the uh, Q&A section so that we also go through them uh, pretty quickly. But also check the ones that are on the chat. So um, probably we can hear this uh, from Collins or uh, Marion. The question asks if treasury bills and bonds can be used as a collateral. Okay, yeah, I'll take it. Yes, it, they can be used because remember they're sitting on a CDS account and with that CDS account, it's just as simple as working with the, with the, with the holder of the CDS account um, to put it as a collateral so that they move it as a collateral. So it's mostly a question of the banks because some banks would take, some banks would not take. Uh, maybe DTB can tell us if they specifically take, if you specifically take it as a collateral, but it is possible because it's just a question of moving now in your CDS account, putting it on a collateral. And then now the collateral owner, like now the bank now has some, some say over disposal of, of the particular assets. Thank you so much. Uh, which debt strategy uh, would you advocate for the poor vis-a-vis -vis the rich uh, who borrow to finance big projects and are taking big risks uh, and hence big incomes? Okay, I'll take that. 
Basically, when we say poor versus rich, is really how they utilize their borrowing. Like you find, I, we said the rich will go to the bank with a plan to borrow to put it in a project that will generate income. So that's how they become rich, really. You initially have a good idea, you have some capital, you have your character in check, and all the conditions we've looked at are favorable. So you're borrowing for production. Really, you're borrowing to put it in a project and all factors held constant and things working in your favor, because sometimes there are external factors that may be beyond your control, but should all things work well based on your projections, then you put the money into a project that's gonna bring back money, then that's how we say people become rich. But the point in this case we are saying is, you're actually going to borrow and the money is not going to be put in a project that's revenue, even though it's a mamamboga. You know, they can actually grow. Like I can give you a simple example of a client many years ago who her history really was, um, she used to sell mangoes in a sack by the, in a market. You know, so when she came to the bank, she would say, I want to grow from uh, selling nini, um, mangoes to tumba clothes. And she so the money she took, we actually would buy bills for her and she would take the bill and sell. And from there, it was multiple bills. She ended up having containers in Gong Town where now she was a landlord. And by the time we were exiting that relationship within the six years period, this lady even had a mortgage you know, and actually was unschooled. By the time we were funding her, she could barely speak Kiswahili. You know, somebody had to translate for me to understand what you're saying. So even though you're a small person, why you borrow is very important. So consumption, what we mean is, like for food, you know, where you're taking money that will never come back. You know, you have to figure out how to pay back the money once you've utilized it. But production is, it's a business idea that you're injecting the money into and it has enough return to cover the principal interest and you have some profit left. So it's really about sitting down and thinking, why am I borrowing for what purpose? So that's really the difference between rich and the poor in terms of debt strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a really profound and a very good response. I think I would just take a step back to the question that we just answered and hear from a DTB perspective, probably. Uh, Roy, you can help us uh, understand if uh, treasury bills and bonds can be used as a collateral in uh, DTB uh, for financing. Treasury bills. Yeah, yeah, they can be used as a collateral for financing. Amazing. Only, Thank you so I, much. I, I, I only need to... Okay, for, for treasury bills, yeah, yeah, we can, mine, we can use this for financing. All right, all right. Thank you. I just wanted to have that clear so that uh, everyone who is on the call will also uh, have that knowledge and when they want to uh, do the borrowing, then it would not be a problem because they have the information. Um, I see a question and I can see so many questions on the on the Q&A. So I will just couple as many as possible just to make sure that we also answer them within the time that we have. So now... What is the range uh, from CRB that would uh, place someone in uh, as a good borrower and the CRB rating affect the interest rate that uh, the bank gives uh, to someone or the amount of money that the bank gives to someone? I don't know if Roy, you want to answer or we can hear from Collins. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know if, if DTB does, um, uh, you know, like uh, risk rating kind of pricing that would probably come from yourself. Yes, but when in CRB, in, in CRB, they really are what, what, what uh, consumers normally don't know is that there are ratios, there are rates and ratios. Um, insofar as like when, when the CRB you call it, it can tell you there's a rank. Like if this is an excellent customer, you could be you're paying up to date with all your loans, but then there are there there are rates, uh there there's a rank. So bank to bank look at those ranks uh, and then this make decisions. But we can hear from DTB if you use those ones in pricing as well. Marion, you could be able to tell us the could you be able to tell us the the ranks or the rates, the ratios? Usually the report, like I said. If you actually send that uh, 
message CR credit report to 21272, the report actually explains, like it will be a green, an orange, a red, and then it tabulates for you based on how many um, applications you've made and I mean, loans repaid, outstanding, it explains. Actually, when you read your report, it will tell you the same way the banks read it and they know whether to take the application or not. That's why we, we are empowering you to be able to pull it yourself. It's self-explanatory. Even at the back, it says if it's orange, very high likely to not pay. If it's green, very good customer, like triple A. Like it, it's got a scale and a scoring uh, module, model that you'll be able to just... It's self-explanatory, actually. When you read it at the back, there is a footnote that explains everything at the at the foot of your report. What the based on the information all the lenders have given concerning you, where you've borrowed or not borrowed. Actually, you might have never borrowed, and it gives you a poor score because we don't have anything to rate you on. So it's very interesting, but it's good to pull your own and be able to assess. And again, like we said, if you can't do a self-assessment. You take your documents to a financial and tell them, okay, tell me, am I qualifying or not? And if I'm not qualifying, explain to me why I'm not so I can improve and qualify next time. Thank you very much uh, for that. It's important to, to understand uh, what the basis of qualification are, and that has been clarified. So um, there's a, a request from uh, Alfred. He's requesting, I don't know if... Uh, yeah, he's requesting for a contact of uh, someone who works at DTB. So I think, Roy, you can uh, handle that. He says that I am soon coming uh, into business opportunity in the oil industry, which will require some uh, small financing. Kindly assist with a contact of uh, whom I can talk to about this. So I think you can just uh, answer on that question and probably provide an email. That would be uh, great. And then sure. the other question... Okay. The other question is uh, by Maureen, and she asks, would you advise taking a loan for consumption as a cash flow strategy to be able to uh, still have funds if you need to do uh, business? Collins? Yeah, no, the answer would be no. Because remember, consumption is really like uh, you're buying things to use as opposed to production where you're borrowing to produce. So I, I will not put a consumption as part of a strategy uh, insofar as the business is concerned. Yeah. Okay, and uh, just even before you go so very far away, because this is very related to that, um, and, and from what you have said, I would like to uh, just read the question, are life assurance policies part of the assets that can be used as collateral when taking uh, out a load? Like, do you think they should, would be part of the assets? Yes, uh, the answer is yes, because again, the insurance companies allow or provide for, um, um, you know, anything that can be put up as collateral, like we talked about the treasury bills, the CDS can allow, insurance companies can also allow. They can say, okay, fine, there is this life assurance and it's going to mature after so many years and someone is, um, you know, bound to get so much money. So they can write that policy uh, give you the policy um, uh, to the owner. The owner takes the policy to the bank, and then they uh, take it as a collateral. Then the bank communicates to the to the insurance company with the with the authority of the customer. In that particular instance, then the insurance company will note that this particular asset or uh, insurance has been you know tagged up or used as a collateral. So yes, it's very possible. They normally work with. Depending on banks, it could be even up to 50% of whatever matures. Uh, but remember, the, the insurance company will always be very careful to give you information insofar as, say, for example, if I stop paying my policies today, what happens? You know, so so they, they will tell the bank to take a level where that has already been paid up and then all those uh, conditions, terms and conditions uh, would apply. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, clarification. I... I think there are two questions that I would like to pass on to, to Roy. And the first one is, uh, do you offer an check of loans to salaried customers who are, are not account holders with CTB and at what rate and what duration? And then uh, related to that is one can get a loan based on the business plan, like uh, 
uh, based on a business plan. Have not been banking with us for. We cannot give loans. They need to be banking with us for at least six months. Then we can give, and then they check off if they are. They need to be secured if they are not uh, check off. If we don't have any agreement with the organization for check off plan. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, so I hope now that we are um, answered. So I'm done with the questions that were on the Q&A section. And thank you so much to all the participants who have uh, sent their question there. I'm trying to check if there are any on the chat, just to make sure that uh, we also don't leave uh, any question unanswered. But I can see uh, Laban really has raised uh, their hand. So Laban, I don't know if you want to unmute and you can ask your question. Yes. Now, um, yes, go ahead. Late, late, good afternoon, everyone. Now, now, uh, good, good morning. My question is, uh, to the panelists, um, in the in the asset financing, because now you realize that banks can give can give asset finance finances to, to even clients who are not banking with them, but they require statements from maybe statements from whatever bank that you've been using. Uh, and for some businesses, you'll find that they, they are using bank, uh, they're operating with bank and also operating via merchant account, that is M-Pesa pay bill or M-Pesa till my accounts. So uh, are those uh, the third party, I would call them the third party M-Pesa merchant or Zidad? Thank you. Roy, you can you can respond for for the ones who are using M-Pesa statements. Uh, right uh, at the moment we have not started considering them. Since you know M-Pesa is not uh, it's not under our regulatory Central Bank of Kenya. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that response. And just to notify the participants, someone had asked for a contact that they can contact uh, from DTB. That has been shared on the chat. I think I'll reshare it shortly, but you can just check the message from Ellie, uh, one of my colleagues, and it still will be resent again. So you can just check. And uh, there's a question on the chat. Uh, good morning. Uh, at a situation where you've been uh, taken a facility, where you've taken a facility that runs for 12 months and where the interest have been spread for all the 12 months, but unfortunately you find uh, a financial breakthrough after three months and you find a financial breakthrough after three months, would you only pay the interest that is accrued for the three months or you will... Uh, account or pay for the interest from the other remaining months as it was uh, in the paper or in the contract? I can answer that. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so you're only supposed to pay the interest accrued up to the day you're paying off the loan. Okay, thank you so much uh, for, for that uh, response and that is quite clear. Then on the Q&A, back to the q and I've seen um, a question that is saying, after opening an account with DTB, is it possible to take a loan without a person uh, as a guarantee or without a guarantor? And if I advise my friends uh, where to bank? It is possible, but you... you... The criteria, you, you have to have a security and you have to have banked for more than six months. Then we will also look at your cash flows and what is the need for that loan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And probably one last one, because I can also see uh, time is uh, still moving. So uh, how do banks deal with new startups and uh, startup businesses and uh, giving the financing facilities or loans. 
Roy, you can just give us an overview of how you deal with startups, like what is required from a startup to get a facility kindly. Okay, again, they must have built a relationship with us before uh, we before we start financing them. We cannot do what you know. We cannot do based on the projections and on a, 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 a paper. Like you know, when somebody writes a, a projection or he writes a, a, a his program, so you see that will be risky because we don't know if this money will go directly to that kind of business. So normally we want them to build a relationship with us, then we can finance them with our security. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate and I am seeing all the uh, amazing responses that are on the chat. Uh, thank you so much for, thank you so much for being uh, a very active audience. I would li I like to hand this over now to Mantui so that uh, she can guide us on the way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Thank you for leading the great Q&A session. A big thank you as well to uh, Marion, to um, Collins, and our very own Roy. We, we, we are really grateful. And so as we wind up, I'd like to welcome closing remarks, um, first by Collins, then Marion, as well as Roy, and then we'll also have our head of sustainability and citizenship who is in the chat, who is in the call, that is Anne Derry, before now we, we give our closing remarks and our and our vote of thanks. So thank you and welcome, Collins. Well, yeah, thank you very much, DTB, uh, Kenya Bank Association, for this opportunity, and thank you for everyone who has participated. We do uh, push and bolster for access to credit because access to credit helps growth. Uh, that's the best way to grow businesses quickly. Uh, and even as you grow, uh, work with your banks. Like now DTB has given this opportunity, um, you know, as a business person out there, this is a bank, I would hold on to them uh, very closely because hey, you're saying now you've trained me, now I'm well trained, now give me the funding. You know, I'm wishing you all guys all the very best. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Collins. And then I think we'll have Marion. And, and just before Anne, I'd also want to invite Ellie um, so that we have Marion, then Ellie, then Roy, and then Anne will, will finalize for us with the closing remarks. Thank you. Karibu, Marion. Mm, thank you so much, uh, Mantui, DDB team, KBA, and all the participants uh, of this training. We are so honored to have taken you through the nuggets we have shared and experienced with clients in the past and presently. Um, my parting shot would just be remember that um, one of the biggest assets an individual or an organization uh, can have is credit worthiness. So uh, do the right things, um, plan yourself, have a debt strategy, be patient with the journey, but do the right thing consistently and you will find yourself really having been catapulted. That is a good thing. It's not a thing to run away from. Should you be in trouble, we've shared nuggets on how to get back on track. We know the economic times are difficult, but we are able to overcome and still succeed in this day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> So we can have Eli and then Roy with the closing remarks. I think I think there's some challenge with sound. Some challenge with sound. Okay, so I think as they try and sort that, I'd, I'd like to invite Anne, who is our head of sustainability and citizenship of this entire training session and who's been quite um, engaged and supportive throughout. So Karibu Sana An. Thank you very much, uh, Mantui. I want to just say thank you very much to our participants. I want to begin with you because um, when we set out to do this, uh, we hope that you will join us and that you will find these sessions useful. And by your participation and, and 
coming back, you keep coming back. You've shown such passion and such zeal. I am sure you've learned as much as I have. Um, I think you have a, an edge in the sense that, you know, it's one thing to have the passion for the business to even know what you want to do. It's a different thing, um, especially for those of us who've not been trained on how to run a business to understand how to run it to be taught by experts for free so this has been a great investment on your part and we're hoping that soon we'll get to hear stories from you of how these training sessions transformed your business it may be a big transformation it may be an incremental transformation everything is important and everything is good so thank you so so much for your time for attending and we truly do hope like i said to hear from you soon i want to thank alnet i want to thank kenya bankers association uk tech hub uh the dtb team that has been working on this um and has been very instrumental at some point i know ellie held fort um you know it's it's this kind of partnerships um that create impact are what this brand is all about and so thank you very much. I mean, Team Alnet, your, your trainings, and Team UK Tech Hub, your trainings, and I know that IFC also spoke on sustainability. Um, your trainings have been very useful even to me um, because remember, there's enterprise development, but there's also financial literacy training. And just listening on do not borrow for consumption, borrow to invest. Um, it's something that everybody needs to hear um, regularly so that we can be more financially healthy. So Asenteni Sana, and we really, really look forward to seeing you. Rehab <laughs> Mbiu, I'm seeing you saying that at 10 weeks of dedication, you need your certificate. Your certificate will come along. But I think if you get a certificate and this does not help you become better in your business, um, we will still not have done our job properly. So as much as you're chasing that certificate, remember certificate is a paper, it's important, but the most important thing that you'll gain from this is the ability to be a better entrepreneur and to be to be able to, to, to take care of yourself, take care of the society, take care of the economy and contribute in a more meaningful manner. So please apply everything you've had from here. And if you need more insights, more information, you can always reach out. As Anthony Sana and do have a most beautiful day. We will be reaching out with more fireside chats. I know we had spoken about those. They will be rolled out. Those won't be trainings, um, but do reach out. Just tune in to hear from experts. There's nothing as good as continuously learning and hearing from those who are better than us. As Anthony Sana. Uh, Mantui. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And just picking up from where she's left off, we, we're actually organizing a fireside chat for next week, Friday on 15th. Remember, we had mentioned it earlier, and, and yes, we are working on bringing something your way. So look out. Um, and as she's also mentioned, we are now going to the next stage of organizing for certification. Um, so we will be communicating the details on the emails that you use to register for these sessions. Um, and so stay tuned. Uh, this is a journey and we, we are continuously on it. As you know, this is the, actually the fifth, the fifth edition of this particular training program and it's onwards and upwards, okay? So thank you so, so much. I'll read a few comments from the chat, um, even as, as we wind up. So we have Christine who says, thank you so much DTB for this truly empowering 10 weeks. My business is definitely going to adopt various changes, perfect way to spend the holiday do, doing restructuring so i'm ready for 2024 that's that's a perfect way so we have we actually have given you guys a, a starting ground for for the resolutions you'll be making for 2024 only that these ones we will see them through so thank you so much we have teddy saying thank you this was a very good training session it was my first time with dtb this year and they offered all this thank you it is our pleasure i'm teddy so karibu sana we have Steven saying, thank you so much for the important training sessions. Um, Clinton saying it has been a 10 weeks of transformative engagement. Um, this is surely the case. And continue sending your testimonials, even on email. Um, if you've implemented something new, we would be glad to hear from you. We also have Joyce. I, I can mention Joyce especially because she's been quite um, active. She said, grateful to DTB for the amazing training sessions. I've learned a lot and looking forward to rejoining the future sessions again and again my financial knowledge is on a higher level now thank you we 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 are really grateful for all the amazing feedback we are receiving on the chat thank you thank you very much and allow me just to um mention our send language interpreters we've had byron and abigail and lillian and brenda who've been part of this journey thank you so much um the sign language interpretation team we've had alnet 
we've had IFC, as Anne mentioned, we've had really a, a, an amazing host of people, even from DTB, we've got, I mean, we've also had UK Kenya Tech Hub finalizing with today's session. We've had um, Marion and Collins, thank you so much. Uh, we've had uh, even DTB team members, we had Derek Obwaka from the risk management team. We've had today Royan Songo, Assistant Chief Manager in Business Banking. Um, we've had Ellie, who's also held forth, uh, held forth during different sessions as well. We've had Josiah. We've had Roselyn from KBA, who's been wow. leading the team from the KBA front, who's been quite, quite supportive. Um, special mention to Gloria from the digital team and Andrew, who really helped from the technical side and also information on infinity. Um, I mean, the list is an ending. This has been a team effort. It has been um, amazing working with different people, amazing interacting with DTB customers and even and customers. And we hope that even at the end of this session, if you're not already a customer, that you are um, sold to come on board because we are quite interested in your growth, in your development, and in the scaling of your businesses. So ladies and gentlemen, um, this is the end of the 10 module um, training session we've had for the DTB KBA Financial Literacy and Enterprise Development session. It has been a great pleasure. I'm working with you on this journey. As we've mentioned, stay tuned for um, the good stuff that will be coming your way. Other than that, I'd like to wish you a good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Goodbye.